Good morning and welcome to the 22nd Annual Open Government Summit. My name is Kate Sadek. I'm a Special Assistant Attorney General and Chief of the Open Government Unit. For the first time in its 22-year history, the summit is being presented in a virtual format with no in-person attendance. Over the last several months, all of us have had to adjust to the new reality presented by COVID-19, and in particular, the challenges presented for carrying out governmental functions in the midst of these unique and dynamic circumstances. Transparency and public trust in government is more important now than ever. Our presentations today will focus on the Access to Public Records Act and the Open Meetings Act and providing you practical guidance and training for complying with these two important statutes. These statutes are really essential for ensuring that government in our state is carried out in a manner that is open and accountable to the public. Throughout the presentations today, we'll also touch upon the current emergency executive order that pertains to the AFRA and the OMA and give some guidance for complying with these important statutes in the context of COVID-19. Before we proceed, I want to extend a special thank you to Jay and to ClerkBase for our helping to make this live stream of the summit possible. For many years now, ClerkBase has worked with us to live stream the summit, and that's more important this year than ever. So thank you to ClerkBase for helping us to be able to offer this virtual summit. I'd also like to thank Roger Williams University Law School Alumni Association for co-sponsoring the event again this year. And I'm happy to introduce Dean Gregory Bowman, who will offer his welcoming remarks. Good morning, everyone, and welcome uh, from the Roger Williams University School of Law. My name is Greg Bowman, and I have the honor and privilege of serving as the dean of this fine institution. We have had a busy summer, uh, an interesting summer, and we are excited to welcome our new students and our returning students back to the law school over the next two weeks. Um, and um, it's been a challenge, but we are excited to be back. Excited to be rising to the challenge of these pandemic times. I joined the faculty here at Roger Williams University School of Law because I support and I believe in the law school's mission to prepare our students to be the lawyers and leaders of the future who are ready to change the world. And during my move to Rhode Island to join the faculty here, I developed a close working relationship and friendship with Michael Yelnowski, uh, who recently stepped down as dean. Uh, he is a leader and a colleague of mine whom I greatly respect and admire. Michael and I have dedicated our lives to teaching, and we believe in the mission of this law school. And we've worked together to ensure that my transition into the deanship and the conclusion of his deanship has been a truly seamless transition uh, for the good of all. So in my role as dean here, I am ready and I am eager uh, to continue building and expanding upon this school's nearly 30-year foundation as an excellent provider of legal education and of service to the legal profession and to the state of Rhode Island. But again, these are strange times. I spend a lot of my time in my office at home and here in virtual meetings with members of the legal community in Rhode Island. I'm eager, however, to engage with and meet the members of the state's legal community as well, virtually at first and hopefully in person very soon. I'm excited to get to know many of you, the members of the bar, the judiciary, many of our alumni, those who have hired our alumni, those who have acted as speakers at our conferences or as adjunct professors, and always as friends and supporters of our law school and its mission to train the lawyers and leaders of the future. And I'm also enjoying my first steps to um, explore this beautiful state of, of Rhode Island. Uh, there's so much to do here and I look forward to more exploring. So again, Glad to be here. I'm glad you are here with us virtually. 
I'm excited to be part of today's critical conversation on open records and open meetings. As this law school's founding dean, the late beloved Tony Santoro stressed, one of the law school's founding purposes, besides educating the lawyers and judges of the future, is to provide an independent forum in which we can freely debate critical topics in the legal profession. And it is fitting that right now, as I stand talking with you, I am standing in our classroom dedicated to Dean Santor. So today's event is that kind of forum. And I want to thank the Rhode Island Attorney General's Office, which is home to a large number of our alumni, for partnering with our law school on this essential dialogue. And I look forward to meeting many of the state's leading lawyers taking part in this virtual event today. So thank you again for being here virtually, and for those of you in person, being here in person, and have a wonderful morning program. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. We're also happy to have Amanda Milkovitz of the New England First Amendment Coalition, or NEFAC, joining us by video this morning. NEFAC is one of Rhode Island's most ardent advocates for open government and is pr providing training resources related to public records and open meetings since 2006. NEFAC has an important perspective to offer regarding open government and we're so glad that they're able to participate in the summit again this year. And welcome to the Open Government Summit. My name is Amanda Milkovitz. I'm a reporter at the Boston Globe, and I'm also a member of the New England First Amendment Coalition. We're a coalition of lawyers and journalists and academics and historians and pretty much anybody who cares about Hello and welcome to the Open Government we Summit. My name is Amanda Milkovitz. I'm a reporter at the Boston Globe, the Amendment, and I'm also a member of the New England First Amendment Coalition. We're a coalition of lawyers and journalists and academics and historians and pretty much anybody who cares about the First Amendment. We train journalists and we also weigh in on issues critical to the First Amendment, such as open records and open government and open meetings. That means we can be a resource for you as well. In my work, I've always seen public servants as being really critical to understanding the government and how it operates. Like reference librarians, the very best ones are extremely helpful and helping us find information to understand how the government operates because they understand that transparency is critical to a functioning democracy. State Representative and Providence Police Sergeant Ray Hull, when he was in charge of the Providence Police Department, once told me, these are not my reports, these are the people's reports. And I like that. Thank you again for attending and consider us as a resource. You can find us at nefac.org. remarks. Good morning. Um, this is a different year this year, uh, but we're glad to be coming to you again from Roger Williams University Law School. So let me begin by thanking the law school for hosting this year for Dean Bowman, who I got a chance to speak to just before coming in. It was great to meet him, and I know he is ready to lead uh, Roger Williams University Law School uh, into the future. Um, and it's a relationship that I look forward to continuing to build with him and the law school. I also want to thank uh, the team uh, from my own office. Uh, Kate Sadak, uh, Dylan Gaddis, who's our, today is his last day with us. So Dylan, we wish you well as you go off uh, to your next adventure. Sean Linus who's now joined academia uh, and has come back, uh, has come back uh, home. And Kayla O'Rourke, who is with us here as well today, they'll do a great job of taking you through everything you need to know about open government. When I took office as Attorney General on uh, January 1st of 2019, the one thing I told my staff was, don't let me die on the open government hill. Um, what I meant by that was, I wanted to make sure, I wanted to make sure that we were being really thoughtful about how we address this topic. And frankly, I didn't think that I'd be spending near as much time as I have ended up spending on open government, whether it be the OMA or the APRA. But I believe that that time has been well spent. And every time one of those issues comes up in the office, I always ask myself, and I ask the team to ask themselves the same question, is can we uh, turn this over 
and then should we? Always keeping in mind the default position of the APRA, which is documents that are held by public agency, the default position is that they should be turned over. Now, I've got to tell you, as a 25-year prosecutor, that is a difficult position sometimes to take for heart, to heart. And I know that when I stand here and I say this to you and ask you to do that, there may be some of you who are out there who wonder, well, how does that apply in his own office? And I can tell you that we take those concepts to heart. I'll give you an example. You know, we struggle a lot about uh, evidence pre-trial in criminal cases. And this has come up recently in the context of body camera footage, in the context of excessive use of force. And while we don't have many of those cases in Rhode Island at present, we do have some, we don't have many, but we've got a plan for the future and how we'll handle those cases. And it's very easy as a prosecutor, it's very easy as a prosecutor to take the most conservative position possible when dealing with that issue. It's very easy to say as a prosecutor that turning anything over before trial is going to damage my criminal case. And it may, and it may. It may also violate the rights of the accused. But we've taken the position in the office that before we reach that conclusion, we've really got to think through all the consequences. We can't just say there'll be a negative consequence. We've got to think that through. We've got to research it. What will be the negative consequence? What are our responsibilities under professional rules of responsibility 3.6 and 3.8? And I suggest that that's the process that we should go through whenever we're dealing with an open government issue, whether that be for us in the criminal context or in the civil context in my own office, or whether you're dealing with issues out there that you deal with uh, with respect to your agencies. Someone may say to you, we've never done that before, or that's the way we've done it in the past. And one thing I, I've tried to bring to the AG's office is to rethink everything. Be prepared to rethink how you've done things in the past. You may end up in the same place. You may end up in the same place. But if you're thoughtful about it, you may end up in a different place, and that may ultimately be the best thing for the public. And I will tell you, I have come to the firm conclusion that the more we can share with the public, the more credibility we'll have. It's why I put in legislation now for the last two years to allow me to issue a grand jury report in certain circumstances. The grand jury is a time-honored, effective tool, but it is not a transparent tool. And there are some cases where that lack of transparency, where no indictment is returned, can lead to a uh, perception that the government is not sharing everything that they should, and it may damage the credibility of an institution, including my own. And so I ask you to take that to heart when you think about these open government issues. Understand that information is by default public. And think when you're on that line, when you're on that line, whether to disclose or not, think about the credibility of your own agency when you're being as transparent as possible. And so I'll leave it there, and I wish you all uh, a great virtual Open Government Summit this year, and I hope very much that we'll be able to be in person together next year. Thank you very much. We'll now turn to our presentations. As usual, the summit will consist of two main presentations, one on the APRA and then one on the OMA. After both presentations have concluded, we'll have time for a question and answer session. We've actually already received a number of questions that were sent in advance during the registration process. And if you have questions that come up during the summit, you can still send those questions in to us. You can do so in two different ways. You can email the AG Summit email address that you use to register for this event. That's agsummit at riag.ri.gov. Or you can also send us questions via Twitter at AG Nerona. So feel free to send us your questions as the summit goes on. We're going to try to answer as many as we can today. If we don't have a chance to answer your question today, please feel free to reach out to our unit at any time. Our contact information is on the website under the Open Government page, and our contact information is also in the slides for today's presentation. I'd like to also draw your attention to the digital summit booklet that's available on our website, 
And there's an email sent out earlier this week to everyone who's registered for today's event that provides you a link to that digital sum summit booklet. The booklet contains an agenda for today's event, as well as summaries of our recent findings and resource materials related to the APRA and the OMA, such as checklists of important considerations to keep in mind. So that's a helpful resource. I encourage you to look at that on our website. Also, the slides from today's presentation are available on our website. And the email that anyone who registered received earlier this week also contains a link to those slides. So I also encourage you to pull up those slides, follow along, and keep them from your reference going forward. As many of you know, we also have a listserv that we use to circulate our open government findings as they're issued. If you are not part of that listserv and you'd like to be added, just let us know and we'll be happy to add you and you can receive our open government findings as they're issued on a regular basis. If you'd like to be added, just reach out to the open government unit or email the AG Summit email address that you use to register for today's event. Live viewing of today's event is also eligible for CLE credit. If you'd like to receive CLE credit, then you'll need to sign up at the end of the program today to verify your attendance. We'll provide more specific information for the steps for doing that later on in the program, but please keep in mind that if you do want CLE credit, you'll have to sign up today verifying your attendance. One final item I'd like to note is that the Department of Business Regulation, along with a number of other entities, including our office, have been working on putting together a training that will focus on conducting virtual meetings in light of COVID-19. That training will take place on September 17th at 9.30 in the morning, and more information will be coming out regarding that event. It'll be a panel-style event, and it'll be virtual. Our program today is really focused on the nuts and bolts of the APRA and the OMA, understanding those statutes, understanding how to comply with them. If you'd like more information regarding best practices or tips specifically geared toward virtual meetings, then I recommend that you plan to attend that training in September. And you may also want to look at the reference guide that the Department of Business Regulation has put out on their website. It's a very comprehensive document. It includes input from a variety of stakeholders, including our office, and it includes a lot of best practices and practical tips for conducting virtual meetings in light of COVID-19. So with that, I'll turn the podium over to Special Assistant Attorney General Kayla O'Rourke and Sean Linus, who will begin the presentations, starting first with the APRA. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean Linus. We're really delighted to be here. And thank you again to the Roger Williams University School of Law for having us uh, under, obviously, slightly different circumstances this year. Uh, but we really hope that you're going to get a lot out of this presentation. Um, we really love giving uh, these presentations. The summit really is our, our flagship event. Um, and, and we're always delighted to do it. And, and hopefully, uh, if you've seen it before, you'll learn something new. And if you haven't seen it before, um, you'll get a really good grounding on the Access to Public Records Act, as well as the Open Meetings Act. So let's get started with the Access to Public Records Act. Um, and you know, I think most people really get sort of the intuit, the, the basic idea behind the Access to Public Records Act, which is that the public has the right to access public records, right? They're the public's records. Um, but there's a second component as well, and it's found right here in the statute. And that's that in addition to the public having the right to access public records, Individuals also have a right to dignity and privacy. And for those of us who are custodians of public records, we really have an obligation and a duty to respect that privacy um, of those private individuals as well. And so we'll see how those twin goals of the Access to Public Records Act play out um, as we go along. Before we get any further, we want to start things out. I know it's early on a Friday morning. Thought we'd start out with a little movie clip. Um, this is from the movie Red. That's a file. 
cell number. You need to visit the back room. You're going to meet the records keeper. I didn't even know this place existed. It doesn't. Moses file. You gotta be kidding me. Humorous clip, right? Um, but I think the reason that it's funny is that there's a little kernel of truth to it, which is that when a lot of people out there think of public records, that's what they think of, right? The underground vault, the long hallway, the redactions everywhere, pretending the file doesn't exist. Um, it, it really, I think, exemplifies how public records are viewed by a lot of members of the public. And so if we know that that's the perception out there, it's really our responsibility to make sure that that's not the experience that Rhode Islanders have um, when they make a request under the Access to Public Records Act. Right? This should be funny not because it seems a little true, but it seems so far off. And in Rhode Island, I want you to keep in mind that we're always going to be striving to make that clip as far from reality as possible. So the first question under the Access to Public Records Act is, are you a public body? And I think for a lot of public bodies, town councils, police departments, school committees, um, you understand you're a public body, right? And your local book club, Scrabble group, you know you're not a public body. Um, but, but know that it's a really very fact-specific question, right? Obviously, governmental entities are public bodies. Um, there's another part of the definition as well, which is that entities that are acting on behalf of or in place of a government entity are public bodies as well. Um, but again, these are very fact-specific questions. Um, you can see on the slide here, there's a, a couple different findings that we've, we've issued recently, really interrogating you know, whether something is a public body. But again, I think for, for most of, of those listening out there, you either know if you're a public body um, or not. So how does the Access to Public Records Act get triggered? Well, the first step is you have to be a public body. The next step is you have to get an Access to Public Records Act request. Right? The statute is a very reactive statute. It only really comes into play once that request is made. Um, so it's really incumbent on, on those who are members of public bodies um, to understand what a public records request looks like. And the things I want to emphasize here um, are that the Access to Public Records Act is about providing access to documents. Right? It's not about answering narrative questions. It's not about providing summaries in response to a request. It's about providing documents. Um, we've got a finding uh, here on the, the bottom part of the slide, a, a relatively recent finding, where a requester asked a public body to define the term unknown that was used in a series of documents. Well, we said that's not really a public records request. Right? They're, they're asking a narrative question that would elicit a narrative response. Um, that's not recognized um, as a public records request under the Access to Public Records Act because it wasn't asking for documents. Now, just because someone asks a question doesn't mean that you can just say, well, it's not a public records request. I don't have to do anything. Right? We always want to be mindful. If there are ways to answer that question with documents, you should do so. And of course, there's nothing in the Access to Public Records Act which prevents you from picking up the phone, talking with that requester, trying to really figure out and clarify what documents they're looking for. All right, so the next question that we have to ask under the APRA is, is it a public record that's being searched for? Well, under the APRA, a public record is defined as any material, regardless of physical form, that's made or received in connection with the transaction of official business. So that's pretty much everything that we do as public employees. And it could be electronic records, hard copy records, audio, video, it doesn't matter. Anything made or received in connection with the transaction of official business is a public record. We start with that broad, basic premise. And then there's a second part of that definition that says anything maintained or kept on file by a public body is also a public record. So it's not necessarily documents that you create within your own agency. It may be records that you received from another agency or even individuals. Anything within 
the government warehouse is a public body, uh, um, excuse me, is a public record. And now, of course, there are certain exemptions that we will get into later that narrows the scope of what a public record is. But by default, we start with the basic premise that everything made or received in connection with the transaction of official business is a public record. And now when a public body receives an APA request, the first thing they need to do is figure out what sort of search they need to conduct in order to find potentially responsive documents. And that search has to be reasonable in light of the request and the documents that are being sought. So we have a graphic on this next slide that sort of shows you where a public body should search when looking for public records or looking for records that are responsive to the request. They start with the person who created the records. They look at their electronic files, probably their hard copy files. Maybe there was somebody else that worked on that file as well. So we have to go to their electronic records and their hard copy records. Maybe you need to go to a file room or your archives if the records are no longer stored at your physical location. And then maybe you have your administrative or support staff. And then you also need to check their records as well. It's going to depend on the type of request that's being made and the type of records that are being sought. However, you need to cast a wide net and make sure that when you're searching for records that are being sought, that search needs to be reasonable. Because of course, if a complaint comes to our office, we're going to request that your public body provide us with an affidavit attesting to the search that was conducted. Whose records were searched, who conducted the search, when the search was conducted, and of course, what records were retrieved. And if you're attesting to us that that search was reasonable, then you need to actually believe that statement. So if you're looking for records and you think, well, maybe I need to check someplace else, perhaps we should get IT involved, then make sure you're doing those steps and you're looking for conducting a search that's going to reasonably find these potentially responsive documents. And now, there is a caveat here um, when you're searching for responsive documents, that there is no requirement under the APRA to compile, um, reorganize, or consolidate data that's not maintained in the form that's being requested. And then of course, like any good law, there's an exception to that, and that's for records that are maintained electronically. So if you maintain certain records electronically that are being requested and there's certain data you may need to compile or extract from those electronic records and it's not unduly burdensome to do so in order to respond to this request, the public body is required to take that extra step and do that. So we're going to get into some scenarios here that sort of outline what I was just talking about. And we'll start here. So say your public body gets a request for emails. Well, are you required to search a public body member's private email? The answer, of course, is it depends. You know, do they use their private email in connection with their transaction of official business? If so, then yes, you would have to search that public body member's private email for potentially responsive documents. Now, around the office, we always uh, talk about the Ghostbusters line, you know, you don't cross the streams. You conduct your official business with your official email and your private business with your private email. So that if a request comes in, you don't even have to think about whether your private emails could be implicated. For example, I know that all of my official Attorney General's Office business is conducted with my official Attorney General's Office email. So I do not need to check my private email when a request comes in. However, again, if your public body member does use their private email in the connection with official business, that email needs to be searched. Now, our next scenario here is that you received a request for a list, but there's no list that's already maintained. Are you required to compile that list? Again, the answer is it depends. Do you maintain that list or that data in electronic format? And is it unduly burdensome for you to do that? If it's not, then you need to create that list that is responsive to that request. Um, for example, we received a request a few years ago for a list of all the prosecutors in our office. And we went to HR and they said that there was no list of just the prosecutors. However, we had a list of everybody in the office. So it was simple enough to control find all of the criminal prosecutors and create a new Excel spreadsheet with those prosecutors and turn over that list as responsive to the request. Now, of course, another idea along with this scenario is a database in, in generating a report. Is somebody making a request for certain data 
that is easy enough for you to go into your database, click a few buttons, and generate a report that is responsive to this request? If so, your public body is required to take that step and do that to respond to the request. All right, now we're going to get into some of the exemptions. So again, we start with that broad-based presumption that everything maintained or kept on file, made or received in connection with the transaction of official business, is a public record, right? And that's the bottom part of the stoplight, the green part of the stoplight. You presume that those documents are public. Now there's a narrower subset up the stoplight, the yellow, um, which is the exempt documents. There are 27 exemptions under the Access to Public Records Act. Don't worry, we're not going to go through all 27. We are going to highlight, however, the, the ones that come up the most often. And what I want to stress about the exemptions is sometimes we'll hear, well, it's exempt, so I can't give out this record. Not true. Right? Under the Access to Public Records Act, just because a document is exempt doesn't mean you can't, in your discretion, still decide to give it out. Um, we'll, we'll talk in a moment um, about Exemption M, which uh, exempts correspondence to or from elected officials. Now, just because a, a particular document falls within that exemption, can you still give it out if you want to? Absolutely, right? And I think that that's exactly what the Attorney General was talking about earlier. If there's a fork in the road, um, exemptions really are that fork in the road, right? You can exempt the document and withhold it, but you can also decide in your discretion to give it out. There is a very narrow subset of documents, the red part of the stoplight, that are confidential by law. Right? And again, we'll, we'll talk about that um, category in a moment, but, but know that it's a very narrow, small subset um, of documents. Now, before we get into the individual exemptions, um, a couple of things I, I want to stress here. And the first is that any reasonably segregable portion of a document must be made available. What does that mean? Redaction. Right? The, the, the line in the office is you go through the documents that are responsive with a scalpel to see if there are portions that maybe are exempt, maybe they implicate privacy interests, maybe it's a date of birth, maybe it's a social security number. Can we none, nonetheless redact that information and produce the rest of the document? Um, if we can, right, any reasonably segregable portion of that document must be made available. The Access to Public Records Act requires us to do so. And the second part is that if the entire document is exempt, you have to state in writing that it is exempt. Um, we think of this really as sort of a, a, a chance to sort of pause, step back, and reflect. Is that whole document that you're going to be withholding, is it really all exempt? Right? And, and maybe it is. Maybe, there are, you know, maybe it falls within an exemption. Maybe it's confidential um, by state law. Maybe there are reasons to withhold it. Um, but if you're going to do so, you have to state in writing that no reasonably segregable information exists. And again, it's, it's an affirmative obligation to give you that chance to sort of you know, think it through again um, and make sure that that's really the case. OK, uh, more or less in alphabetical order. We'll go through the exemptions now, starting with exemption B. And this is trade secrets, commercial or financial information, which is of a privileged or confidential nature. Um, the sort of the, the Lodestar case in Rhode Island is a Providence Journal case in 2001. Um, the federal analog to the Access to Public Records Act is the Freedom of Information Act. It has a very similar exemption. Um, and the, the United States Supreme Court actually just ruled on that exemption last year uh, in the Food Marketing Institute case. Um, so a couple cases to, to check out if you're interested in, in learning more about that exemption. Exemption D. Law enforcement. For the members of the law enforcement community, I'm sure you're familiar um, with this exemption. Um, records maintained by law enforcement agencies for criminal law enforcement um, can be exempt, but only if, and it has to fit within one of these six subcategories. Um, and, and sometimes we'll hear, well, it's an ongoing criminal investigation. Um, but take a look. That's not what the Access to Public Records Act says, right? Um, if it's reasonably expected to interfere with investigations of criminal activity or enforcement proceedings, then yes, it can be exempt. Um, if it deprives a person of a right to a fair trial, right? Um, the Attorney General was talking earlier about um, things that would adversely affect the accused, right? It has to fall within one of these subcategories. Another three here, um, right? Those that are uh, documents that would be expected to identify a confidential source, disclose techniques, procedures, or guidelines. Right? Again, if, if you're a law enforcement agency and you're seeking to withhold documents under this exemption, you need to make sure that it falls within one of the subsets. Um, and, and again, we, you can't just say, well, it's 
ongoing criminal investigation. It has to fit within the actual language of the statute. Right now, related to law enforcement records, of course, as I said before, like any good law, there's an exception to the exemption. And here it's for records related to the management or direction of a law enforcement agency. And records reflecting the initial arrest of an adult shall be public. So those types of documents do not fall within an exemption uh, for withholding. Rather, these are public documents. And now we're going to talk about adult arrest logs. So under the Access to Public Records Act, Adult arrest logs must be available within 48 hours or 72 hours if a request is made on a weekend within, uh, within the time the request is received. However, that time period only applies to arrests of an adult that are made within the preceding five days of the request. So if you're asking, if you receive a request for an arrest that happened you know, yesterday, you would have to respond to that request within 48 hours. Um, however, if you receive a request for an adult arrest log that happened, you know, three weeks ago or three months ago, then you would follow the normal timeline under the Access to Public Records Act to respond. Continuing with adult arrest logs, there's certain information under the Access to Public Records Act that shall be public related to adult arrest logs. For example, this list includes the full name of the arrested adult, the year of birth, the charge or charges, um, against that arrested adult, as well as the date and time of arrest and uh, the race of the arrested adult. Th that information shall be public under the Access to Public Records Act. Now, continuing with the exemptions here, we're moving on to Exemption E, and this is for documents and records which would not be available um, by law or rule of court to an opposing party in litigation. So this includes normal litigation uh, privileges, such as your attorney-client privilege, your work product privilege, and your deliberative process privilege. Now, the case that you'll see at the bottom of this slide, which is the Providence Journal versus the Executive Office of Health and Human Services, this finding was issued by our office earlier this year. And we really delved into what the deliberative process is under Exemption E and what documents fall within that process and fall within that privilege. So I would point you to that case specifically if your public body is looking into using Exemption E's deliberative process privilege to possibly exempt documents. And now, Exemption K, of course, exempts any preliminary drafts, work product, memorandums, or impressions um, from what the definition of a public record. So these are really the drafts um, that you're looking at, that, that process um, before you reach your final product. And now, of course, the exception to the exemption is any of those records that I was just talking about, your preliminary drafts, your memos, your work products, if any of those documents are submitted at a public meeting, they become public. So your public body loses the opportunity to use Exemption K to exempt those documents if you submit them at a public meeting. And now the finding at the bottom of this slide as well, Finnegan versus Town of Situate, we really examined this exception to the exemption in the context of a public body member reading off of their notes and using their notes while at a public meeting. We determined in that specific case, and based on the, the facts that were presented to us, that the notes of that public body member were not public and were not submitted under um, or at a public meeting as evidence or as part of the record. Therefore, the public body was still able to utilize Exemption K to exempt those records. All right, Exemption M. I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Uh, correspondence over to elected officials. Um, and, and again, I think this is a good opportunity to remind you that just because something falls within this exemption doesn't mean you can't give it out, right? You have discretion. Um, something could fall within this exemption and you could very well decide, I'm going to give out um, that document. Exemption P, right? Investigatory records related to uh, possible violations of statute, rule, or regulation, other than, of course, final actions taken. Um, and again, I think this is part of the Access to Public Records Act, um, you know, solicitude for sort of the thought process, the, be the before. Um, but that final government action, that final action needs to be made public. Exemption S, this is the red part of the stoplight that I was talking about earlier. Again, it's a very narrow subset of documents, but there are going to be documents out there that are prohibited 
from, from being released. They are marked confidential by federal law, state law, rule of court, uh, or regulation. And just a couple examples here um, that, that we've seen, you know, police records relating to the arrest of a minor. Those are confidential. You do not have discretion. You cannot release those documents. Um, 911 telephone calls in Rhode Island are confidential. Healthcare information, BCI records. Again, these are instances where the legislature has determined these documents are confidential. Um, but again, they're, they're sort of the, the small part, um, a very small part of the documents that we hold in our, our warehouse. And you know, certainly, um, I encourage members of public body, if you're not legal counsel, to, to talk with your legal counsel if you have questions about whether a document might fall in um, under Exemption S. Exemption Z, um, individually identifiable evaluations of public school employees made pursuant to state or federal law or regulation. Um, again, I, I think there's an idea here that you know, we want to protect the privacy um, of some of these individually identifiable um, public school employees. Okay, uh, returning now to sort of the beginning of the alphabet, um, exemption AIA, uh, or A1A, all records relating to the client-attorney relationship. Now, Kayla already talked about the attorney-client privilege, which is a common law privilege that, that's used in litigation. It tends to fall in under exemption E. There's also language in the Access to Public Records Act that's a little bit broader than the common law attorney-client privilege, all records relating to a client-attorney relationship. Um, this provision also includes documents relating to a doctor-patient relationship. Again, healthcare information um, can be held, uh, withheld under this exemption. Continuing with our sort of out of order alphabet here, and moving on to exemption A1B. This is the exemption that we see most often implicated and most often used uh, by public bodies to withhold information. And this relates to individually identifiable information that if disclosed would be a clearly unwarranted invasion of personal privacy. So, um, and this also implicates the balancing test that we're going to be discussing in just a few minutes. So under this AIB exemption, um, while we have a balancing test for individually identifiable information, certain information related to public employees, um, sort of outside of that balancing test and outside of this exemption, and this information on this slide shall be public. So if you receive a request for certain public employee information and it's this information, you do not conduct the balancing test. Rather, it is, this information is already public and shall be disclosed, such as um, the position, the salary, um, and also your, your work, maybe email and telephone, and that information as well. However, um, if you do have information that is on your, the public records that are being requested and it's individually identifiable and we could have an unwarranted invasion of personal privacy, a public body is required to conduct a balancing test. Does the public interest in having these documents, in the disclosure of these documents, outweigh the privacy interests that may be implicated in these documents? Now, uh, we're gonna show you another fun little movie clip here to wake everybody up on this Friday and Sean's gonna Play it for me. Thank you. It's white. Surprise. White. Uh, what? What are you? What are you doing here? How do you uh, know where I live? It's called the Freedom of Information Act. Gabe. Everybody loves dodgeball. So as Sean mentioned before, the Freedom of Information Act is the federal counterpart to our Rhode Island Access to Public Records Act. And sometimes we'll, we'll refer to, to federal law in helping us interpret our APRA laws. But that clip just goes to show you that while we do have and while we start with the basic premise that everything maintained or kept on file by us is a public record, we have very sensitive information within our government warehouse related to um, private citizens, including their home addresses, which there may be cases where we do turn that information over. Um, however, we do have to conduct our balancing test, which is tipping the scales. We, where does the scale tip? Does it tip in favor of public disclosure or does it tip in favor of withholding that information because the privacy interest is great? 
and now under the Access to Public Records Act, the public interest is does the information shed light on government operations? Will disclosing this document tell the public what their government is up to? And now under the Access to Public Records Act, when a document is disclosed, it's public to everybody. So remember, public to one person, public to everybody. So the public interest goes beyond just the individual requester's interest in the documents, but rather it is a broad interest of the public itself. Does this information shed light on government operations? And then of course, the privacy interest part of this test, it's when there's individually identifiable information in our records, when it's related to private citizens, that's when the privacy interest is at its apex. And that is when we need to take a step back and really look at the information that is contained in these documents and weigh the balancing test. And then of course, we take that step that Sean was talking about before with our scalpel and we see if we can redact the information that implicates privacy interests in order to make that document available to the public. And now uh, we're going to also discuss internal affairs reports because we've seen this come up a few times um, in the last couple of years um, because members of the public request these documents and sometimes they don't agree with, with what is turned over and what is not turned over. However, with internal affairs reports specifically, you also need to conduct that balancing test on a case-by-case -case basis, on a report-by-report -report basis. And of course, is the public's interest in having this document outweigh the privacy interest that may be implicated? Does disclosing these documents show the public what their government is up to? And now when you're evaluating whether or not these documents may fall within an exemption or may or may not be withheld under the Access to Public Records Act, we've listed some factors here that may be relevant when conducting the balancing test. Now this list certainly isn't exhaustive, and again, it needs to be conducted on a case-by-case -case basis. Some of these may apply, some of them may not apply, and of course there may be other factors that certainly come into play. But these are at least basic factors that should be considered when you're conducting your balancing test based on these reports, um, such as you know, the rank and position of the officials involved, whether or not the misconduct was founded, and then of course, whether redaction can effectively ameliorate any privacy concerns. As a public body, you have to take that extra step and ask yourself whether there's any reasonably segregable information on these documents. Can you take your scalpel and redact the information in these reports that may implicate privacy interests or may implicate other information that could be withheld under the APRA in order to turn over these records to the public to be more open and transparent? All right, so let's try some scenarios, because I know we've been throwing a, a lot of information at you. Um, so let's try to put some of those ideas into practice. Um, this is a scenario that uh, I know our office sees um, from time to time. I know we've gotten questions and complaints, so I know other public bodies see it too. And that's when a requester seeks their own case file. right? And I, I think there's really two ways to look at this. Um, the first is the Access to Public Records Act angle. And that's what, as Kayla was saying, you know, under the Access to Public Records Act, it's not about is it public to this person, it's about is it public at all, right? If it's going to be public, it has to be public to everyone. So the very fact that a requester is requesting their own case file, you know, that's not really dispositive in terms of the analysis. Um, you know, I'm reminded of, of the city of Providence, which has a really great online portal for public records. Um, and if you request records from the city of Providence, your request goes on that online portal. If the city of Providence produces records, they're on that online portal public to one, public to all. Um, you know, and I can certainly think of situations where a requester requests their own case file. In our office, maybe it's a criminal case file, um, where there are very s substantial privacy interests, um, really, really heightened privacy interests um, that would prevent disclosure of that document to the public at large. Um, so again, that's, that's sort of part one, the APRA angle. There's also sort of the common sense angle, right? Which is that the Access to Public Records Act is not supposed to be you know, thwarting common sense. Um, you know, I can think of plenty of examples where someone's requesting their own case file, for example. The only privacy you're protecting is that person's privacy, right? There's no reason why that person shouldn't have access to that document. And there's nothing in the Access to Public Records Act that stops you from saying, 
Well, look, under the Access to Public Records Act, um, the privacy interests outweigh the public interest. It's going to be withheld. But outside of the Access to Public Records Act, we're going to nonetheless provide you with that document. Um, so again, I, I don't want the Access to Public Records Act to be thought of as this enemy of common sense. When someone's requesting their own case file, if there's no good substantive reason to not provide it to them outside of the APRA, I think you should do so. Um, and, and again, I think you know, citizens really expect that when they're asking for documents um, related to themselves. OK. Another scenario, and, and this is something we've seen a number of times, and I think that this really helps illustrate the weighing of the, the balancing test, is when someone requests job applications and resumes for a public position. Right? Uh, we've seen this a couple of times. We've done a couple findings on it. Um, I think it's a really good way to, to put the balancing test into practice. So someone requests all of the applications and resumes for an open position. Someone's already been hired. Um, how do you look at that under the balancing test? I think there's really two parts. One is there's a person who got the position, and there's everybody else who didn't get the position. For the person who got the position, let's do the balancing test. What's the public interest in knowing their application and resume? Well, it sheds light on what the government was thinking when they hired that person. right? Um, it shows whether they were qualified. Um, it shows what they um, represented about themselves and their background. I think it certainly sheds light uh, on the government um, performance of its statutory duties. What's the privacy interest? Well, certainly you have the person who's in that position. It's, it's their privacy interest. Um, but maybe there are ways to sort of ameliorate that privacy interest through targeted redaction. Um, and of course, I think there's a, a somewhat of a diminished privacy interest if that person's already in that role. What about everybody else? Everybody who applied for the job and didn't get it, right? Uh, there's not as much of a privacy interest there, right? These people were not selected. Um, it doesn't really say much about what the government was up to, right? It doesn't say why they weren't selected. It just is their application. It is their resume. Um, sort of conversely, there is a pretty substantial privacy interest, right? These are folks who apply for a job and, and didn't get it. Maybe they uh, didn't want it public that uh, they were out uh, job hunting. And so in instances where someone's requesting the job applications and resume um, for folks who applied for a position, um, our office has said the balancing test works for the successful applicant you have to disclose. Uh, and for the unsuccessful applicants, you can, in your discretion, withhold. APRA procedures. So we've talked now a lot about the substance of the Access to Public Records Act. And indeed, a lot of the substance of the Access to Public Records Act is, as I described earlier, reactive. Right? You wait for that request to come in. That request comes in, and you're responding. Um, APRA procedures, I think, are somewhat overlooked. Um, they're really a good way for those who like to plan ahead um, to make sure that your public body doesn't run into any problems. They're a way to make sure um, that your public body is properly adhering to its statutory responsibilities. So first, every public body has to have written procedures regarding the Access to Public Records Act. Um, and, and something I want to note here, and the, the, the statute makes this very clear, you cannot require that somebody submit uh, a written request, so long as what they're asking for is readily available pursuant to the APA, that's the Administrative Procedures Act, um, or otherwise readily available to the public. What does that mean? That means you can certainly prefer that people submit their requests in writing. Our office certainly prefers that. I think it's easier for both the requester and for the public body. Um, but what I always think of is someone's coming into DEM and requests a, a boating license application, right? something that's very readily available to the public. It's in a pile right next to the, to the kiosk. Can the public body then say, well, you have to put it in writing? No. right? Again, the Access to Public Records Act, it's not supposed to be the enemy of common sense. You cannot require a written request if what they're asking for is available pursuant to the Administrative Procedures Act or otherwise readily available to the public. Your procedures must include the following. right? Identification of the designated public records officer, how to make that request, where to make that request. Um, you know, something we, we always think of, this is a really good way to make sure um, you know, our office, uh, if you want to submit a public records request, we have a designated email. Um, that way we can really ensure that if record requests are coming in, we know where they're going. We make sure we check that email spam folder, something that's come up a number of times. Um, you know, if you're the designated person where those records requests are coming to, you should be checking your spam folder. Right? It's part of your procedures. Um, it's part of your obligations under the law. Um, but note this here. There's no requirement that the request be made on the public body's form so long as it's identifiable as a request. 
What does that mean? That means certainly when someone comes up and says, I'd like to make a public records request, you could hand them the form and say, we'd really like it if you'd fill this out. Can you require them to fill it out? No. Right? Someone one time came to our office with a post-it note that said, I would like you know, XYZ records and put it through the glass and, and walked out. We treated that as a public records request. It wasn't on our form, but it was readily identifiable as a public records request. We were obligated to treat it as a public records request under the law. Procedures, right? They have to be posted on your public body's website um, and otherwise be readily available to the public. We make ours available on our website. Here's a little uh, cutout from our website. Um, if you haven't done so in a while, take a look. Take a look at our APRA procedures, um, our APRA policies, um, and, and you know, use them as a guide. If your, your public body is thinking of maybe changing your procedures a little bit, you know, ours are certainly a, a resource for you um, a, as you look at that. A public body cannot require, as a condition of fulfilling a request, that the person provide a reason for the request or uh, that they provide personally identifiable information. Essentially, if someone requests a record, you can't ask them why and require that they answer that question before you respond to their request. Right? Again, it's not about why that one person wants a document. It's about whether that document is public to all. You also cannot require that they provide personally identifiable information. If they want to, they certainly can come up with a post-it note right through the door and say, I'm not going to provide any personally identifiable information. That's their prerogative. And if you take a look at our, our uh, excerpt of our public records request form here, um, you'll notice that it says name, optional, address, optional. Again, we prefer that people use this. It's easier to contact people if you have their contact information, if you have their name. Um, but they, they're not required to provide that information. We have had instances where people have put the post-it note um, you know, over, the, uh, over the door and, and just said, I want, I'll come back in, in you know, 10 business days for the response. We actually have at the bottom of our public records request form a notice saying, if you don't provide this information, it will be available, our response will be available at our main office. And we have had instances where individuals choose not to provide their information, um, and we just make it available you know, at, at our front desk of our, of our headquarters office. Now we're going to get into what I think of as some of the most important slides um, for this presentation, and it is the timeline for a public body to respond to a request made under the Access to Public Records Act. Now this is where we see the majority of the complaints that we get before our office. I get tons of telephone calls from members of the public and public bodies alike on these issues. So we're going to really stress the timeline here for, for public bodies and of course members of the public that are watching with us today. So within 10 business days of receiving a public records request, a public body must do one of three things. They either grant access to the records and provide those records to the person requesting them. They can extend the time to respond to the request for an additional 20 business days under the APRA, giving the public body 30 business days from the date of the receipt of the request to respond. Or, of course, they could deny access to the records either in whole or in part. But at least one of those three things has to occur during that first initial 10 business days from when you receive that request. And now, uh, when calculating the 10 business days to respond to a request, the date of receipt is day zero. So if I go back to my office and I have a public records request sitting in my email today, today, Friday, July 31st, would be day zero. So Monday, August 3rd, would be day one, business day one. So um, if you receive a request after normal business hours or on a weekend or a state holiday, that request is deemed received as of the next business day. And now, when, you're, when a public body is extending the time to respond to a request under the APRA, first they get an additional 20 business days, but they have to explain in writing the need for the extension. And they have to explain that right to the requester and provide that to the requester. And it needs to be specific to the request being made. You can't use boilerplate language. And the, the need for the extension also has to relate to one, one of these things um, specifically under the APRA. So either the voluminous nature of the request, maybe the difficulty in searching or retrieving records, or maybe just the volume of pending requests you have before you at the time that request comes in. But this extension needs to be made in writing. And now um, this specific provision 
was changed or modified under the governor's executive orders due to the COVID-19 crisis. And while um, earlier orders did allow all public bodies to request an additional 20 business day extension on top of that already provided under the APRA, the current status of the executive orders only pertain to the Rhode Island Department of Health. So as of right now, only the Rhode Island Department of Health has the ability to invoke an additional 20 business day extension due to COVID-19 circumstances to respond to an APRA request. So for example, the Rhode Island Department of Health could use the, the first 10 business days that are allotted under the APRA, the additional 20 business days allotted under the APRA statute, and then of course, the additional 20 business days under the COVID executive order in order to respond to an APRA request. Um, but I just want to reiterate that no other public bodies may use the COVID-19 extension at this time. It's only for the Rhode Island Department of Health. Um, when a public body is denying access to records, either in whole or in part, for example, if they're redacting information, that denial has to be made in writing to the requester. And it also has to state the specific reasons for the denial, such as the exemptions that the, the information falls under. And it, the denial also has to indicate the procedures for appealing the denial. This is something that we see public bodies um, forget to do. Uh, all the time when they're responding to APRA requests. So you really need to provide the procedures for appealing the denial. And now we're going to get into um, what the procedures it are for, for denying, for appealing in just one second. But if a public body receives an APRA request for documents that don't exist or that they don't maintain, the public body is required to respond to the requester with that information. You have to tell the requester that the documents they're seeking either don't exist or aren't maintained by your office. Um, and it is a requirement that you do so. So now, what constitutes a denial? Now, there could be several different um, things that fall under this category, but most of them fall within, you know, withholding the document in whole. Maybe the entire document is exempt from the definition of a public record. For example, maybe it's a BCI record, which is required to be kept confidential by law. Um, maybe you're holding, withholding the documents um, in part, which is you're redacting certain information. Maybe, you know, there's that social security number on that document. So you redact it and you explain the reason for uh, redacting that, that information. And then you also explain that in rating when you're denying access to that particular information. And then, of course, when you're stating that no responsive documents exist or are maintained by your office. Um, so that's normally what uh, constitutes a denial of records under the Access to Public Records Act. And now, um, when you're appealing a denial of records as a, as a requester, um, the appeal can be made to the chief administrator, as chief administrative officer of the public body. Um, the chief administrative officer will review the file, review the request, review the response from the public body, and must issue a determination on that appeal within 10 business days of receiving that appeal. And then um, a requester could also file a complaint with the Office of Attorney General Open Government Unit. Um, this is the appeal procedure language that our office uses when responding to public records requests. Um, now, of course, you, you, as a public body, you would need to modify this language to follow your procedures and to be in line with what your public body does. But this is just an example of our language. Um, that we're providing as, as a tool for, for public bodies to, to help you draft your own. Um, now, under the COVID-19 executive orders, um, the timeline to respond to an administrative appeal with a public body has been modified, but this only pertains to the Rhode Island Department of Health right now. So under the current status of the executive orders, only the Rhode Island Department of Health can extend the time to respond to an administrative appeal an additional 10 business days. However, if the Rhode Island Department of Health wants to do that, they have to advise the requester within that first 10 business days allotted under the APRA that they will be extending uh, the time to respond due to the COVID-19 crisis. And again, this only pertains to the Rhode Island Department of Health. No other public body may utilize this additional 10 business day time period extension um, to respond to an administrative appeal. Okay, great. Um, 
So what happens if your public body is granting access to the records? Um, there are a couple of cost and delivery procedures we want to go over. Um, namely that the person requesting delivery is responsible for the actual costs. Um, for example, storage fee retrieval. You know, sometimes we'll get a request for a particular criminal case file from the 1960s, let's say. Um, it's obviously going to be off-site in storage. We don't keep those records in our, our main office. Um, there's a storage fee assessed with retrieving that document. That uh, cost has to be borne or can be borne um, by the requester. Um, let's talk a little bit about prepayment. The Access to Public Records Act uh, allows a public body, they don't have to, but they're allowed to, um, assess a charge for $15 an hour for search and retrieval and 15 cents per page with the first hour of search and retrieval free. What does that mean? That means if you get a request in and think you can handle it within an hour, you absolutely should do so, right? Um, but sometimes you'll get a request in and it's pretty voluminous. Um, and you know it's going to take more than an hour. You may decide that prepayment um, is the route that you want to take. Now in those instances, we really encourage public bodies to use that first hour. Um, use it to do the search, the retrieval, maybe even some of the review. Um, to get a real sense of how much time it's actually going to take. Right? And within that first hour, come up with a reasonable prepayment estimate um, that you can assess $15 an hour um, for future search and retrieval and review. Of course, you cannot charge more than the actual reasonable cost um, for providing electronic records. Now, sometimes you'll have a, a particular requester who makes multiple requests in the same 30-day uh, time period. Well, they don't get a free first hour each and every time, right? Under the Access to Public Records Act, um, multiple requests from the same person or entity in the same 30-day period counts as one request for that first free hour purpose. Um, but note here that all fees will be waived if you fail to produce the uh, requested records in a timely manner. Um, the prepayment estimate is a, a chance for your public body to make a really good faith estimate about how much uh, search and retrieval review time is going to take you to respond to that public records request. It's not, an, it's not an a chance or not a way to, to attempt to scare off the requester by assessing a really high prepayment. Right? It has to be in good faith. Um, if those records are not produced in a timely manner, all fees can be waived. Um, and that has happened in the past. Now, tolling the time. We get this question sometimes, well, I got the request in. I did my first free hour. I came up with a really great prepayment estimate. Um, do I still have to keep searching and retrieving while I'm waiting for that, that payment? And you know, the answer is you can. You don't have to. Right? The time can be told. Um, production of records shall not be deemed untimely if you're awaiting um, receipt of the prepayment. So suppose you get a request in. You, um, you use those first couple business days to make your prepayment estimate to do that first free hour. On business day three, You've used up your first free hour. You've got your prepayment estimate for an additional five hours. That prepayment estimate goes out. Um, the time is told then on day three. Right? The time doesn't start up again until you receive payment. Suppose you receive payment for that prepayment of those five hours a week later. Well, now it's going to be business day four. Right? Um, and, and so I, you know, I, I think for public bodies um, that get a lot of requests or are very worried about voluminous requests, you know, this, this time tolling provision is something to be mindful of. Um, here's sort of the usual ordinary course in non-COVID times, and that's that at the option of the person requesting the records, they can request them basically in the format that they want, right? If they want them in paper co copy, they can get them in paper copies. If they want them by fax, they can do that, um, right? It's at the option of the person requesting the records. Now, of course, if complying with that would be unduly burdensome, um, you know, then the public body doesn't have to do so. Suppose you get a, a public records request, you want to produce it electronic format, it's 15,000 pages. Um, and the person says, I want them in paper format. Well, maybe then it would be unduly burdensome. Um, but as sort of a, a usual matter of course, non-COVID times, the person can request the format of the records. Likewise, um, they can request to obtain them in any and all media in which your public body is capable of providing them. Sometimes we'll get a request um, for an Excel spreadsheet. And sometimes I've heard from you know, public bodies and solicitors, well, we really don't want to provide the you know, Excel spreadsheet. They've requested it in that format. Can we just give them a PDF? Well, if they've requested the Excel um, format and you're capable of providing that, you do have to provide that in Excel format. Now, 
Things have changed a little bit under the executive orders, um, under the Access to Public Records Act. We'll, we'll talk um, a little more about the, the Open Meetings Act in the next session, where things, I think, have changed a little bit more. But one of the areas that has changed is that if the person requests um, documents in, in paper copy or by fax, um, you can produce them in electronic format instead of being required to produce them in any and all media, right? And that, that's pursuant to the governor's executive order. And I think it's a recognition um, of sort of the, the different unique circumstances we find ourselves in. So, under the Access to Public Records Act, any member of a public body who has the authority to grant or deny access to public records must receive training under the APRA and the chief administrative officer of that public body must certify each year by January 1st that those employees have received their training under the APRA. Now, today's training that you're watching counts. So, congratulations, there you go. And then this training will also be available by recording on our office's website for the next year. And you can also watch that at any time and that also counts towards your APRA certification training. And then our office does conduct trainings throughout the year at public bodies' requests. Um, so feel free to call us if you'd like to set one up for your public body anytime throughout the year as well. Um, now when complaints are filed with our office, um, we will investigate the alleged violations of the Access to Public Records Act, and we will certainly go through the uh, whole procedure of our complaint process at the end of the Open Meetings Act presentation, but we're just gonna touch on some of the highlights right now. So a complaint comes in, we investigate the violations. Complaints can be submitted to our email at opengovernment at riag.ri.gov um, at any time. Um, and then we will also review the complaint and conduct our investigation and issue a finding based on those allegations and based on the application of the law to, to the facts before us. If we find that the violation or the allegations were meritorious, our office does have the ability to file a complaint in the superior court against the public body on behalf of the complainant um, to seek injunctive or declaratory relief and civil fines. Um, a complainant and a requester also has the ability to go to superior court themselves and file a complaint against that public body instead of coming first to our office. Um, uh, superior Court remedies uh, against a, a public body if the violations are deemed founded um, include a $2,000 per violation for a willful and knowing violation and a $1,000 fine for each reckless violation of the Access to Public Records Act. Um, the Superior Court can also order injunctive relief, meaning ordering the public body to produce the records to the complainant and then also the Superior Court can issue um, attorney's fees, which we all know can equal way more than $3,000. Um, so some resources. First of all, our website is a great resource for anything related to the Access to Public Records Act. We have the text of the statute there. We also have some quick guides um, and an APRA checklist for public bodies to use when they're responding to Access to Public Records Act. This summit presentation will be there um, probably you know, within the next few days. Um, all of the findings that our office issues are also available on our website um, if you'd like to review any of those as well. And then we also have guidance and frequently asked questions related to the COVID-19 executive orders pertaining to um, the Access to Public Records Act. You can also reach us by email at our open government email and by telephone, which is also listed um, on this slide. And this is Argo. This is Sean's... Uh, lovely puppy, I think at six months? Six weeks. Six weeks, I'm sorry. That's him at six weeks. And then at the end of the Open Meetings Act presentation, that's when we get to see him all grown up. Uh, for now, we've reached the end of the Access to Public Records Act presentation. If you have any questions, please email us at our AG Summit email or tweet us at AG Narona. So we'll be keeping an eye out for those. Um, for those of you who are itching for those CLE credits, if you pre-registered with us, you'll be receiving a link to sign up for those credits and receive your certificate at the end of the Open Meetings Act presentation. Um, if you did not pre-register with us, at the end of the Open Meetings Act presentation, that link will be available on our website, www.riag.ri.gov. We will also have a survey 
um, for those watching today that we'd love for you to fill out to give us some feedback on this virtual summit, which will also be available at the end of the Open Meetings Act presentation. For now, we are going to take um, a quick five minute break before we dive into the Open Meetings Act. So grab your water, grab your snacks, and we'll see you in a bit.
Yeah, go ahead. Welcome back, everyone, here for the second half of our Open Government Summit. Uh, we're going to continue on now the Open Meetings Act. Um, as Kayla mentioned, the, the dog uh, on the slide here is my dog, Argo, uh, when he was just, just a couple weeks old. Uh, as an incentive for sticking with us, uh, there will be a picture of him all grown up at the end of the presentation. And spoiler alert, he's still cute. Okay, uh, the Open Meetings Act. So we saw during the first half of the Open Government Summit um, that the COVID-19 crisis changed things a little bit. Um, they changed things quite a bit more, I think, for the sort of the day-to-day -day operation of the Open Meetings Act. Uh, just, just something to sort of keep in mind as we, as we go through. We'll certainly highlight for you what the changes are, where they are, how they impact the Open Meetings Act. But something to be mindful of is that the COVID-19 crisis uh, does impact the Open Meetings Act uh, and its operation. So what is the OMA, the Open Meetings Act? Well, again, I think most folks sort of intuit the basic idea behind the Open Meetings Act, which is that public business has to be performed in an open and public manner. Um, I think most people sort of understand that, get the, the policy reasons behind that, and understand it's really in the title of the act itself. But there's another component here, and that's that citizens have to be aware of and advised of what's going on at these public meetings. So what does that actually look like? Well, of course you're going to have your open meetings, right? The default, we talked about the default under the Access to Public Records Act, that every document maintained or kept on file is public. Um, same here, the default under the Open Meetings Act is that meetings of public bodies are open to the public. There are, of course, very limited circumstances where a public body can convene into executive or closed session. Um, so you have your open meetings. Before your meetings, you have to have notice, right? You have to let people be aware of and advised of your meeting. That includes uh, your annual notice, which is a, a, a notice of your regularly scheduled meetings. Maybe it's the third Thursday of every month. That's your annual notice. Also your supplemental notice. Those are your agendas, right? Um, members of the public should be able to look at your supplemental agenda notice and be able to look down and see exactly what's going to be discussed and or voted on at your public meeting. So before your meeting, you have notice. The meeting itself is open. And then after your meeting, meeting minutes. And again, it's just another way for people who uh, maybe weren't able to make the meeting or they made only part of the meeting um, to look back and see what happened at that meeting. Um, but that's really largely it sort of in a nutshell, right? Notice beforehand, open meetings, and then meeting minutes after the fact. Um, almost everything we're going to be talking about stems from those uh, general principles behind the Open Meetings Act. Something we want to stress here is that really those, those requirements from the Open Meetings Act are very bare minimum set of requirements. We say it's a floor, not a ceiling, right? We'll talk about um, supplemental notice, agenda notice. Has to be 48 hours before your regularly scheduled or before your meeting. Now, that's the bare minimum of what the Open Meetings Act requires. Can your public body give a week's notice? Absolutely. And we certainly encourage public bodies to do that. Um, and we certainly encourage public bodies to maintain those kinds of best practices. But when we talk about the requirements of the Open Meetings Act, just keep in mind that it really is a bare minimum set of requirements. The public body can absolutely be more transparent, be more open, and we certainly encourage that. OK. When does the Open Meetings Act come to, into play? Um, there's really three threshold elements that trigger the Open Meetings Act. They are a quorum of a public body having a meeting. You need to have all three elements in order for the Open Meetings Act to apply. If you have two of those elements, but not the third, the OMA simply doesn't apply to that situation. If you do have all three of those elements, the OMA does apply. And you need the notice, the open meetings, and the meeting minutes. So whenever we get questions um, from members of the public, from solicitors, from members of public bodies, 
about the Open Meetings Act, the first thing I'm always thinking of, do we have a quorum of a public body having a meeting? If we do, then the Open Meetings Act applies. So let's talk about those elements. Right? What is a public body? Again, under the Access to Public Records Act, I, I said, uh, if you're a public body, you probably know it. Right? And I think that's largely true here. Um, subdivisions of state or local government are public bodies. Um, but again, it's a very fact-specific question. And I want to make clear to folks that labels really are not dispositive here. So the fact that you call something a ad hoc advisory committee, um, that doesn't really tell us about what that group does, or that you call it a working group, right? We look to the substance of what that group does, how it was created, all those sorts of factors that go into whether or not something is a public body. Labels really aren't going to be dispositive. But again, I think for most of you, if you're a member of a town council, you know you're a member of a public body. OK. All right, so continuing on, the second prong or second element that triggers the Open Meetings Act requirements is a quorum. And for purposes of the Open Meetings Act, a quorum is defined as a simple majority of the public body. So for example, if you have a five-member board, simple majority quorum would be three members. A seven-member board, your quorum is five members. Now, as Sean said before, um, the Open Meetings Act is a floor, not a ceiling. So your public body may have you know, bylaws or a charter that defines what a quorum is outside of the Open Meetings Act. Maybe your five-member board says that a quorum is going to be four members. That's fine. But your public body cannot say that a quorum is going to be two members or less than a simple majority because that is um, not in line with the Open Meetings Act definition of a quorum. Now, um, we're going to have a little clip again to, to spice things up, to sh really show you the, the quorum element that's required. Mr. Mendoza is present. Under protest. Mr. Cornwall is present. Under protest. Ullman is present, Mr. Walsh, Mr. Goster is present, and Mr. Haas is present. Mr. President, a quorum is now present. So now we certainly aren't condoning manhandling the members of your public body or bringing them in in handcuffs in order to make that quorum uh, uh, happen. But that clip is really just a humorous way of showing that the simple majority of your membership needs to be in the room when you're having the meeting in order to constitute a quorum. Um, now we're going to get into the idea of a rolling or walking quorum. Now, quorums can also be convened by unconventional means, such as a series of one-on-one -on -one conversations amongst members of a public body that are less than a quorum. But if you take those conversations collectively, then a quorum would be convened. For example, if um, one member of your five-member public body talks to another member and tells them about um, how they're going to vote or their opinion on something that's coming before your public body later in the week, and then that person also goes and talks to two other members of your public body, separate from that first person. Well, that person just created a link between three members of, your, of the five-member board, and now a quorum was convened outside of a properly noticed meeting. Um, and now this is something that public bodies need to avoid and that your, your legal counsel should be advising you to avoid because what, really what the OMA gets at is that the conversations, the substantive discussions of your public body that relate to the transaction of official business need to be happening in front of and at an open meeting in front of the public. They shouldn't be done outside of an open meeting either via email or telephone or even social media. Those conversations need to be done at an open meeting. Um, quorums can also be created by a third person not on your public body. Um, so for example, a town manager, maybe they speak with one or more members at one time of the public body and then go and share those conversations with one or more other members of that public body. And that town manager served as a conduit between the members of the public body to form a quorum and to have those substantive discussions outside of a properly noticed meeting. Again, this is something that needs to be avoided um, and it's something that your solicitors should be telling you to, to avoid. And these conversations don't necessarily need to be 
in person. They can also be held you know, via email, such as reply all, which everyone should be beware of. And then they could also happen via social media, which is something that we've been seeing uh, more frequently now that you know, Twitter and Facebook are so popular. Um, listservs themselves, you know, the disseminating of information, such as our open government listserv, which sends out our findings every time they're issued. Listservs per se do not violate the Open Meetings Act and do not constitute a quorum. Why? Because it's a one-way communication. However, if multiple members of your public body are members of the same listserv and they start with a reply all email discussing public body business, um, once you have those collective discussions, that's when the Open Meetings Act is implicated and uh, that's when potential violations could happen. Um, now, we have a nice graphic here that sort of, sort of shows you why public bodies should be avoiding those rolling or walking quorums and those substantive discussions outside of an open meeting. We have here, you know, all those in favor of what we discussed in our email thread and at Larry's son's birthday party say aye. And look, you have all the members of the public body saying aye and the two members of the public saying, I have no idea what's going on. That is exactly what we want to avoid because those substantive discussions, those deliberations of our public bodies need to be happening at properly noticed open meetings. Um, so now we're into the third prong of the Open Meetings Act. We've already covered a quorum of a public body and now the third prong or the third leg of that stool that implicates the Open Meetings Act is a meeting. So under the Open Meetings Act, a meeting is defined as a collective discussion amongst, uh, about matters which a public body has supervision, control, jurisdiction, or advisory power over. Those discussions constitute a meeting. So if we have a public body that has a quorum of its members getting together to have substantive conversations over something within their jurisdiction or control, the Open Meetings Act applies and all of the requirements need to be met, such as the notice, the open meeting, and the minutes thereafter. We're going to get into some scenarios right now to, sh to, to show you and to sort of put those um, issues into practice. Um, so now we have an after meeting trip to a diner. So say your five member public body uh, all decide to go to the classic cafe after your meeting because the meeting was just so awesome um, that you want to celebrate with some milkshakes and some french fries. Well, would that be a violation of the Open Meetings Act? Of course, the lawyerly answer here is it depends. I've already established that we have the public body prong. I've already said that all five members are there, so we have a quorum. But now we're into that meeting portion. Are they discussing, are they having a collective discussion over matters over which their public body has supervision, control, jurisdiction, or advisory power? Are they talking about the fact that they're super excited that the, that the MLB is playing again? Or are they talking about something that is coming before the board later in the week? That's the, the questions that we need to be asking ourselves. Now, if they're talking about the, the baseball game that's coming up over the weekend, they probably don't have supervision, control, jurisdiction, or advisory power over that. So that third meeting prong probably is not met and therefore the Open Meetings Act probably would not apply to that after, din after meeting trip to the diner. However, of course, if they are discussing matters that should be um, done at an open meeting, then the Open Meetings Act probably would apply and that after meeting trip to the diner is possibly a violation. And now our second scenario here is, we have two members of the town council meeting with two members of the school committee. Do we have a violation of the Open Meetings Act here? I'm assuming that you're all yelling to me, no, we don't, because you do the analysis public body by public body. So say we have a five member town council, two members constitute less than a quorum, therefore the Open Meetings Act would not apply to the town council. So now moving on to the school committee, say the school committee is seven members. So two members, less than a quorum, the Open Meetings Act does not apply. Um, 
Google Docs. I'm sure you're all familiar with Google Docs or other platforms that may permit you to um, edit documents simultaneously. Would those constitute a violation of the Open Meetings Act? Again, we're back at the it depends or probably. If a quorum of your public body is all working in the same document at the same time, or even working on the same document at different times, that may be a violation of the Open Meetings Act. If you can see other people's edits or comments and you're responding to them and having that collective discussion within that document. This also pertains to the reply all email, which everybody should be um, wary of and avoid um, because again, you could be um, creating a rolling or walking quorum outside of the open meeting via these types of documents or platforms. And now social media comments. If we have members of a public body commenting on each other's social media, do we think that's a violation of the Open Meetings Act? Well, again, everybody's favorite answer is it depends. You know, we have a public body. We know that, say, all of these members are a part of the same town council, and they're all friends on Facebook. But do we have a quorum of them all commenting or engaging and discussing with each other on Facebook? Say we do. So we have the public body and we have the quorum. But do we have that meeting? Are they collectively discussing matters over which the town council has supervision, control, jurisdiction, or advisory power? Maybe they're just saying happy birthday to some other member of the council or commenting that it's been really hot lately and they're very glad that you know, they all have AC. That's great. That probably would not implicate the Open Meetings Act. However, if they are commenting about things over which the town council has supervision, control, jurisdiction, or advisory power, and a quorum of them are engaging in those discussions via social media, then you probably have a violation of the Open Meetings Act. We've been seeing this come up more and more frequently now that public bodies are utilizing social media um, uh, more frequently in, in the 21st century here. And it's something that you need to be aware of and wary of as members of a public body. Because again, we want to avoid those optics of having those discussions outside of an open meeting. And then of course, we want to avoid having those discussions outside of an open meeting. So a question we used to get um somewhat frequently and, and now have gotten much more frequently uh, due to the COVID-19 crisis is can a public body convene a meeting through electronic means, either telephone, video conferencing, and in you know, pre-COVID days, the Access to Public Records Act is very, or excuse me, the Open Meetings Act is very clear, uh, you cannot do so, right? Discussions of a public body via electronic communication are permitted only to schedule a meeting, right? Before COVID-19 crisis, that was uh, the way the statute um, applied. And there were very, very narrow exceptions to that. Um, if you were on active duty or if you had a disability and could not otherwise participate, um, you could attend then via electronic means. Um, but before COVID-19, um, the goal was to have, as Kayla was talking about, bodies actually in the room, right? That obviously has changed um, due to the COVID-19 crisis. The governor has issued a number of executive orders, um, the most recent one now being 20-46, and that executive order suspends that particular provision of the Open Meetings Act, right? Now public bodies can use electronic means, telephone, video conferencing, to conduct and convene a meeting pursuant to the Open Meetings Act. Um, but along with that comes some other um, attendant responsibilities. And that is that all public bodies have to make sure that there are adequate alternative means of public access. What does that look like, right? And again, this, this is the, the watch phrase or the, the real key um, phrase that you need to be mindful of if you're conducting an electronic or remote meeting. You need to have adequate alternative means of public access. What does that look like? That's real-time public access, such as video conferencing. It has to be available for free to the public. 
Um, now you can, of course, require um, or use a, a, a program that requires a subscription, such as Zoom, GoToMeeting, um, WebEx. There's, there's a number of different types of software out there. You can use one that requires registration, but the key is that it has to be free to access that meeting. Um, members of the public body do not need to be in the same physical location. Again, this is the change um, as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. Even if the public body decides we're a small public body, we want to meet in person, but socially distanced, even if they meet in person, they still need to provide adequate alternative means of public access for members of the public that cannot go in person. In other words, you still need to provide those electronic means of access for the public, even if your public body is meeting in person. Um, obviously, there's uh, sort of a lot of, of learning as public bodies go um, as a result of the crisis. I know um, this is a big change for a lot of public bodies. There really are some great guidance um, documents out there, memorandums out there, that if you're a member of a public body, uh, I, I certainly encourage you to take a look at. Um, the Department of Administration has come out with some guidance, as has the Department of Business Regulation. I know Common Cause Rhode Island has been very active in putting out best practices for conducting remote meetings during this COVID-19 crisis. So um, if, if you're a member of a public body, again, I, I really encourage you to take advantage of those resources um, because Department of Administration, Department of Business Regulation, Common Cause Rhode Island have all really been on the forefront of providing best practices for your public body. So we've talked about the default idea that every meeting of a public body must be open to the public. Now we're going to get into the limited circumstances where a public body may convene into a closed or executive session outside of the public purview within that open meeting. Now, um, there are 10 limited exceptions for which a public body may choose to convene into executive session. We're, again, we're not going to touch on all 10 of those, but we're certainly going to address a few of the ones that we see most frequently come before us. Um, and now, uh, before we get into that, though, we want to talk about the proper way for a public body to convene into and out of executive session and what that requires under the Open Meetings Act. First, a public body must convene into their open session, the meeting that's open to the public and accessible um, by the members of the public as well. And during that open session, the public body states that they're going to convene into executive session for you know whatever purpose uh, under the Open Meetings Act they're doing that for. And then the public body may convene into executive session. But then once the executive session concludes, the public body must convene back into open session to disclose any votes that may have been taken in executive session and of course uh, to convene the meeting uh, or to conclude the meeting, excuse me. And now, um, during COVID-19, obviously, executive sessions can still be conducted, although it's definitely going to take some, some art to, to do that. And while we are not experts on the forums that are out there, as Sean stated, the Department of Administration, especially the Department of Business Regulation, have both issued guidance on how to convene your, your virtual meetings during this time. But at least uh, for our purpose today, we're going to say that yes, executive sessions still can certainly be conducted during the COVID-19 crisis, and they must still um, comply with the requirements of the Open Meetings Act, such as convening into the open session, whether that's via the, the public telephone call or the public Zoom, and then the public body may convene into executive session on another line or another uh, video conference. However, the public body must come back into that open and public telephone or virtual meeting at the conclusion of the substantive executive session conversations. Um, now, something that we want everyone to keep in mind is that the invitation to attend executive session lies with the public body. So they have the discretion um, to invite people or to also exclude them from the executive session 
discussions. Uh, within reason, of course, uh, we certainly have issued findings related to this provision on what's reasonable, um, and we refer you to those findings for specific issues that may come up with your public body. So getting into some of the reasons a public body may convene into executive session, the first one that we see most frequently is for discussions uh, pertaining to the job performance, mental or physical characteristics of a person or persons. These types of discussions can be held in executive session. Again, you're not required to do so, but you certainly can. However, if your public body is convening into executive session for this purpose, three additional things must happen in order to do so properly. First, your public body must provide written notice to the person who is affected by these conversations or the subject of these discussions. That notice must tell that person that they have the right to ask that those discussions happen in open session rather than executive session. And then of course, when that public body convenes into the open session meeting, they must state for the record and have it included in their minutes from that meeting that the advanced written notice to that affected person or persons was in fact provided. Moving on to um, 5A2 here, the public bodies may convene into executive session to discuss work sessions pertaining to collective bargaining or litigation. Um, again, these conversations may be held in executive session. For example, perhaps you're meeting with your legal counsel to discuss uh, pending litigation, those conversations may be more appropriate for executive session. However, a public body could choose to have those discussions in open session. Just because these executive session pr provisions exist does not mean a public body is required to hold executive session to discuss these topics. They can, of course, exercise their discretion. Um, moving on here, a uh, public body may also convene into executive session to discuss investigative proceedings related to uh, potential allegations of civil or criminal misconduct. Um, again, those conversations can be held in executive session. And then, of course, we're going to have um, a provision specific for school committees. A uh, school committee may convene into executive session to discuss uh, disciplinary hearings of juveniles or to review other matters related to juveniles. However, similar to um, the first 5A1 provision that we talked about earlier, the school committee must send advanced written notice that, that this, to the effective uh, juvenile or their legal guardian that the discussion will be held and that that discussion can be held in open session if that affected person chooses to do so. And then of course the school committee has to state that they provided that advanced written notice as well. All right, so we're gonna move on to talk now about public notice. Um, again, I had mentioned earlier that the Open Meetings Act is a very proactive statute. Um, and, and part of that is the notice that you're required to post before you have your meeting. There are two types of notice under the Open Meetings Act. Annual notice at the beginning of every calendar year, and then of course your supplemental notice, that's your agenda items, a minimum of 48 hours before your meeting. Now there's been a little bit of a change in the statute. That 48 hours excludes weekends and state holidays. So if your meeting is on a Monday, 48 hours before would be the Thursday. Right, you don't count the Saturday and Sunday in that 48 hours. What do these types of notices have? Well, the annual notice has your dates, times, locations of your regularly scheduled meeting. Um, maybe your, your town council meets on the third Thursday of every month. Great, that should be on your annual notice with all of the dates listed out for the year. It should also be available to the public on, upon request, as well as posted with the Secretary of State. Right, so f that people can know when your regularly scheduled meetings are going to take place. Your supplemental notice also has to include date, time, location. It should also include the date posted. Um, and that's very important uh, because it has to be within 48 hours before your meeting. It also has to include statements specifying the business to be discussed. 
We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, it is, I believe, the most litigated provision of the Open Meetings Act. We'll talk about what that means in a moment, but I just want to flag it for you here. Um, statement specifying the nature of the business to be discussed, that's your agenda items. So where do you post your supplemental notice? Well, three places. First, the principal office of your public body. Second, another prominent location within the governmental unit. So suppose um, it's a uh, public body based out of the police department. Um, they're going to post it at the police department, another prominent location within the governmental unit. Maybe it's town hall, for example. And then, of course, you have to post it with the Secretary of State online so that even if I you know, don't have the ability to, to get to the police department, to get to town hall, I still have the ability to know what's going to be discussed and or voted on at that meeting. Um, you know, I, I think there's, a, there's sort of a thought that things have really changed during the COVID-19 crisis under the Open Meetings Act, and they certainly have in terms of the ability to conduct meetings electronically. But in terms of notice, the notice requirements remain in place. You are still required to post your supplemental notice in three locations. Um, now, I understand and, and I think our office understands that sometimes uh, the buildings where you normally post that notice may be closed. Um, fine, post the notice on the outside door of the building. I know a lot of uh, towns and communities across the state have outdoor bulletin boards. Perfect, right? You can still post it um, notwithstanding the COVID-19 crisis. Um, if your public body is meeting electronically, you still have to put a place on your agenda. Um, and the place can simply be the URL or the link um, to your Zoom meeting, your GoTo meeting, uh, whatever electronic form uh, your meeting is going to take. If the public body members themselves are going to meet socially distanced um, in a physical location, and they're also going to broadcast that um, remote so that folks can, can access it, if they're going to meet in a physical location, that also has to be posted on the agenda. Um, and, and this is, you know, if you want to see more information on this, it, it comes from Executive Order 20-46. Okay. Statement specifying the business to be discussed. Right? Your, your agenda has to include agenda items of what's going to happen at your meeting. And the idea is you want citizens to be aware of and advised of what's going to happen at your meeting. So here are a number of what we call typically improper agenda items. These agenda items are not sufficiently specific. If I'm sitting at home and I read this agenda item that says old business, new business, am I going to have any idea what's going to be discussed? No, right? Old business, new business could literally be anything. Um, you know, same thing for, for good and welfare. Um, I know some public bodies in, in the past, and, and maybe still some today, uh, use this as an opportunity to basically voice whatever um, members of the public body want to want to voice comments about. Um, that does not tell members of the public what's going to be discussed. It is not sufficiently specific. Same thing, president's report. Again, you're going to need a little bit more information. Whenever I get a call from a solicitor, or uh, a member of a public body and they say, I'm concerned about this agenda item, what should I do? My advice is always make it as specific as you can possibly make it. So if the agenda item is president's report, it's not really going to cut it, right? What is the president reporting on? Put some of those details in there. President's report on fiscal year 2020 budget and potential implications of cuts down the line. Whatever it is, if you can put more information into your agenda item, the better, right? We used to see this, um, any other matter brought before the board, we fortunately don't see that that often. And I think you can understand that's really not sufficiently specific. It could be almost anything. It does not tell members of the public what's actually going to be discussed. Pop quiz, because I know that's what everyone wants uh, on a Friday morning. We're going to go through some agenda items. Um, the reason we're doing this, one, I think it's kind of fun. But two, I think it's good for you 
um, to really understand that this is a, a, a major hot topic under the Open Meetings Act. It's something we see time and time again. It's something the Rhode Island Supreme Court has seen time and time again. And members of public bodies need to understand um, that this is a very, very important provision. You really need to be very mindful. So the agenda item at issue says, quote, interviews for potential boards and commission appointments, right? Just interviews. Um, what actually happened at the meeting, the town council conducted those interviews, but they also voted on those appointments. Do we think that that agenda item is sufficiently specific? I hope at home you're shaking your head no, right? This is the Tanner case from 2005. Um, this was really the first time the Rhode Island Supreme Court took a look at the provision in the statute, statement specifying the business to be discussed, and the Supreme Court said, the agenda item just says you're going to do interviews. It does not say you're also going to vote, right? Um, that was a violation of the Open Meetings Act. Second agenda item says, quote, number four, communications, request for extension from Turner Scott, received 11.30.08 regarding petition of Congregation Jesuit Israel. That's the agenda item. It was before uh, a zoning board, I believe, and the extension itself was granted. What do we think? Is that sufficiently specific? Again, I hope you're shaking your head no at home. Um, that's the Analyt case from 2013, right? Just uh, a number of years later, the Supreme Court again took a look at an agenda item and said, no, not sufficiently specific. This is a zoning board that this agenda item came in front of. There's no description of the property, no address listed. Um, if I'm sitting at home, am I really going to understand what's going to happen at that meeting? The Rhode Island Supreme Court said no, not sufficiently specific. Okay, two more. Stick with me. Um, agenda item says, quote, 7B, approval of RIDE's executive pay plan. Note that it is singular, pay plan. And organization's chart, enclosure 7B. So what actually happened at the meeting? They discussed multiple pay plans, plural, and the enclosure that was promised was not actually posted on the Secretary of State's website. What do we think? Sufficiently specific? No, right? I think you're getting the trend now. Um, this was the Pontarelli case from 2016. The third time the Supreme Court took a look at this provision, um, really in just, just over a decade, and said for the third time, not sufficiently specific, right? Um, you said there would only be one pay plan singular. You discussed multiple pay plans, plural. Um, the agenda item said that there would be an enclosure. The enclosure was not included on the Secretary of State's website. Um, so again, the Supreme Court, Rhode Island Supreme Court has interpreted this provision three times, really in just over a decade. Um, and each time has said not sufficiently specific. Um, I, I think the trend is very, very clear. Um, I think public bodies need to be especially mindful of making sure that their agenda items are as specific as they can possibly be. One last one. Um, the agenda item says, quote, the board may discuss and vote upon the recall election process pertaining to Town of Tiverton councilors Robert D. Coulter and Justin P. Katz. What actually happened at the Board of Elections meeting? They questioned the Tiverton Town Clerk and some of the Board of Canvassers members. Um, this was actually a complaint that came to our office. Um, and this was after Pontarelli, after Analec, after Tanner. We said, yeah, that actually is sufficiently specific. All right, this is the a relatively recent finding from our office um, from just this year. We said, look, the agenda item says that they're going to discuss and or vote. Um, it specifically identified what recall election process, um, where the election recall process um, was occurring, who it was affecting. Um, we said that that agenda item was sufficiently specific. Um, but, but again, we, the reason we spend so much time on this, really stress it, is because we do see these complaints time and time again. And I think, again, I, I stress that the Open Meetings Act is a very proactive statute. If you want to be a, a really on the ball um, and, and make sure that you're protecting your public body. I think one of the best things you can do is make sure that your agenda items 
are really, really closely looked at before they're published to make sure that they are as specific as they can possibly be. OK. Now, executive session items on your agenda also have to be sufficiently specific, right? Just like any other agenda item. Um, you cannot use boilerplate language in talking about executive session. If you're going to go into executive session to talk about more than one topic, you have to list each topic. Um, and there needs to be a statement of each item to be discussed. If you're going into executive session for three different issues, you need to list out all three separate issues on your agenda. So here are a couple of, of examples that, depending on the circumstances, um, are, are likely sufficiently specific. Obviously, it's going to be fact dependent. Um, but, but take a look. You know, the first one here, town manager performance review. They're going in to executive session under 5A1. Right? It's not enough to just say, we're going to go in under 5A1 to discuss um, you know, job performance of, of, a, of a person. Right? They've actually identified who the person is, the town manager, and they've identified what that's for, performance review. Right? That would likely be sufficiently specific. Um, same thing under you know, th this next one's here. They're going into executive session under 5A2. That's the litigation or collective bargaining um, uh, closed session exemption. And again, they've identified it's for the police union negotiation. Um, that likely would be sufficiently specific. Could you make it more uh, sufficiently specific by adding in what you're negotiating over? Yeah. And if you have that ability to do so, we certainly encourage that. Now look at these, um, these last two. Um, these are both litigation matters. Now, you know, look at the first one here. It says, going in under 5A2, potential litigation, land dispute. You know, in that particular situation, you know, maybe the litigation hasn't commenced yet. Um, there might be good reason why you wouldn't want to disclose what particular parcel of land you're going to be talking about. Um, it might harm um, you know, the, the public body's um, you know, litigation prospects. And so maybe there's good reason to keep it you know, at that level of specificity. Look at the next one, right? Going under 5A2, this is for a matter that has already been filed in Providence County Superior Court, right? And because that litigation has already been filed, it's a public document, you might as well list out, again, being as sufficiently specific as you can be, list out what that litigation is. Litigation, plaintiff versus public body, and the case number, right? PC 2018, and then what the number is. Again. Where you can be more sufficiently specific, you absolutely should be. So as Sean's been stating for the last several slides, the supplemental agenda notice of your public body has to have a statement specifying the business to be discussed. So a list of all the items that are going to come before your public body at that meeting for discussion and or vote. However, the Open Meetings Act does permit public bodies to amend their agendas at an open meeting. Nothing within the OMA prohibits the public body from adding additional items to the agenda by a majority vote of the members. Now, school committees are sort of carved out of this specific provision, but we'll get into what requirements school committees have for amending their agenda in just a few moments. But for all other public bodies, you are permitted to amend your agenda at your meeting if you have a majority vote of your members um, in the affirmative. However, if you do amend your agenda and add additional items, for, they can only be for discussion purposes only. No vote may be taken on these additional agenda items unless it's to refer this, this item to another board. Maybe it's more appropriate for your zoning board to, to review that is permitted and also a vote may be taken to address an unexpected occurrence um, that may be affecting the public. Those are the only two very limited circumstances in which a public body may vote on an item that is added to their agenda. Um, and now for school committees, you also are permitted to amend your agenda at your meeting um, under the Open Meetings Act. However, this um, amendment, this additional item, um, can only be added pursuant to a request submitted in writing by a member of the public during the public comment session 
and of course, it can only be for informational purposes only. So while the Open Meetings Act does permit school committees to amend their agendas as well, there are additional requirements that need to be met in order to do so. Um, however, I'd like to stress uh, just for a second here that while the Open Meetings Act does permit public bodies to amend their agendas, amending the agenda should not be abused or used to circumvent the spirit of the Open Meetings Act, which is that members of the public be advised of and aware of the matters that are coming before um, the public body for discussion. Um, so moving here into uh, emergency meetings, um, public bodies are permitted to hold emergency meetings under the Open Meetings Act, um, where the meeting is necessary to address an unexpected occurrence that requires immediate action to protect the public. That is the definition of an emergency meeting under the Open Meetings Act. And now, if your public body has to have an emergency meeting, notice of the meeting and the agenda must be posted in those three places that Sean mentioned before, the, the principal office of your public body, the other place within your governmental unit, and the Secretary of State's office as soon as practicable. So of course, what that means will depend on the specific facts that um, lead to the necessity of the emergency meeting, um, but what a public body needs to remember is that notice of this meeting needs to be posted to the public as soon as practicable. And then of course, at that emergency meeting, the public body must state for the record why it needed to convene an emergency meeting with less than 48 hours notice um, and why it was necessary to address an unexpected occurrence um, that requires immediate action to protect the public. That statement must be made at the meeting and it must also be included in the emergency meeting minutes that the public body will uh, post after that meeting. Now we're gonna move into public comment under the Open Meetings Act. Um, and actually under the Open Meetings Act, there's no requirement that a public body have public comment or an open forum session. That is not a requirement under the Open Meetings Act. Um, now, if a public body does choose to have um, a public comment or open forum session, they are permitted under the Open Meetings Act to limit the discussion to topics um, for the public comment session and also to limit the, the time period of public comment session as well. Now, while our office certainly encourages public bodies to have an open forum session at their meetings, that is not a requirement under the Open Meetings Act. Now, there may be a requirement in your public body's bylaws or charter, but again, that's sort of outside of the Open Meetings Act. But we want to remind you that the Open Meetings Act, again, is a floor and not a ceiling, is the bare minimum requirements. So your public body is always encouraged to be more transparent and more open with their discussions and deliberations at their open meetings. Um, now, a public body and members of the public body can certainly respond to comments that are initiated by members of the public during a public comment session. Um, the public forum session, however, is not a time for the public body members themselves to um, initiate conversations or initiate discussions. That time is at the agenda, which needs to be posted 48 hours ahead of time. However, if the public body has an open forum session and they'd like to respond to comments made or answer questions that are initiated by members of the public, the Open Meetings Act certainly permits them to do just that. And now, during the COVID-19 crisis, um, the public comment provision under the Open Meetings Act is still in place. There is no requirement that public comment um, be had during the COVID-19 crisis under the Open Meetings Act. Um, however, um, we, should, we do note that there may be other statutes or laws or regulations that require participation by the public in open meetings. And if that is the case, then the public body needs to ensure that the members of the public have the ability to participate in these virtual meetings during the COVID-19 time, that the same access that they would have had outside of COVID-19. So during a public meeting where they could participate in person. 
For example, they'd have to make it accessible to the members of the public who are required to participate either via um, video or telephone conference. All right, so we've already established that in order for the Open Meetings Act to apply, you need a public body of a quorum having a meeting. And now we've talked about your notice before the meeting and what's required at the meeting during your um, open meeting. And now we're gonna talk about what happens after your meeting. And of course, after your meeting comes your meeting minutes. And a public body first is required to have meeting minutes. And there's really um, just a few limited items that the Open Meetings Act requires that your minutes have. The date, time, and place of your meeting a list of the members of your public body who are present and absent at that meeting. Also a list of all individual votes taken at that meeting. And then of course, a bit of a catch-all provision, any other relevant information that a member of the public body requests. That's really all the Open Meetings Act requires that your minutes have. But of course, again, the Open Meetings Act is a floor, not a ceiling, and we certainly encourage public bodies to provide more information in their minutes to be more transparent and more open. Now, public bodies um, are required to disclose their unofficial minutes, and they have to be made available at the office of your public body um, within 35 days of the meeting or at the, regular, the next regularly scheduled meeting. They have to be available upon request. And now for disclosing, un or pardon me, official or your approved minutes, first a public body has to maintain official or approved minutes, and they need to be posted on the Secretary of State's website within 35 days of the meeting. Now this is a requirement that must be complied with, of course. Um, however, there is an exception to this. Advisory public bodies, so public bodies whose um, scope of authority is solely advisory in nature are not required to comply with this provision. However, the definition of what an advisory body is is very fact specific. Um, so we would refer you to our findings um, to see whether or not your public body would constitute as a solely advisory, which would exempt them for the, from this provision. Um, also something very important to note is that all meetings of public bodies must be accessible um, to persons with disabilities. So whether that's possibly providing a ramp or closed captioning services or maybe even providing an elevator if, you're, um, if your public body meets on the top floor of a building. The public also has a right to record. Um, it, this isn't something that you're going to find in the text of the Open Meetings Act itself, um, but there are uh, case law going back to, to as far back as the early 80s that says the public does have a right to audio or video record a public body. Um, of course, that's subject to reasonable restrictions by the public body, um, but it's, it's, it's come up you know, often enough and it's certainly been um, you know, litigated through case law that, that we want to make clear the public does have a right to record open meetings. Um, and, and they're open meetings, so you know, there's really no reason um, that they shouldn't be allowed to do that. Complaints, right? Um, the Open Meetings Act uh, permits our office um, to receive complaints. Um, it's what we've been talking about, um, you know, a, lot of, uh, a lot of what we've developed about the Open Meetings Act has come through complaints that have come to our office. Um, you may submit complaints, members of the public, members of public bodies can submit them. Um, we ask that you do so in writing to our open government at riag.ri.gov email. Um, and it, it works very similar to how um, we talked about in the Access to Public Records Act context. Um, we'll investigate the complaint um, and if, you know, issue a finding if we believe there's been a violation. Um, and if we think that those allegations um, of violation are meritorious, we can file suit in superior court. Um, but of course, the complainant need not go first to our office. Um, someone um, uh, who, who thinks there's been a violation can go right to superior court um, by him or herself. 
Now, in superior court, um, the superior court has this authority under the act. They can declare um, actions null and void um, via injunctive relief. So suppose your public body had an executive session um, and it wasn't a proper reason for executive session. In that executive session, your public body voted on something. Um, if the court finds that there was a violation, they can declare that vote null and void. Um, civil fines can also be imposed by the superior court, up to $5,000 for a willful or knowing violation. And of course, um, they can assess attorney's fees and costs, which um, you know, I, I think we're aware can, can sometimes be more than, than the $5,000 civil fine. Um, this is a somewhat complicated slide, so I'm not going to go into every little bit of it. Um, but it describes our complaint process. I know sometimes there have been questions um, from members of the public, from legal counsel. Um, this is a slide to take a look at. Um, the basic idea behind our complaint process is that it's an open and transparent way um, for us to investigate allegations of violation. A complaint comes into our office. If we think it alleges a violation, we will open it as a complaint. We send out letters to both the complainant and to the public body explaining our procedures. We allow the public body the opportunity to respond to those allegations. And that response comes to us as well as to the complainant. And then the complainant has an opportunity to offer a rebuttal. Right? And again, that rebuttal comes to our office as well as to the public body. It's an open process. At that point, our office will review, investigate, do the necessary research, and ultimately we will issue a finding, either a finding that there wasn't a violation based on the facts or that there was a violation, and then we can make that determination whether we think it was willful or knowing. But again, if you have questions about um, our complaint process, I, I you know, direct you to this slide. It's going to be available on our website. Um, I think it really puts um, a, a comprehensive gloss on, on what that process looks like. Resources. Again, we, we, uh, our, our statutory role is to accept complaints, but we would so much rather have someone pick up the phone, type out an email, send us a letter before there's a violation and get some information, um, then have that violation and, and then have there be a problem later on down the line. And so as much as this presentation is about trying to explain to you these statutes, you know, we don't expect that you're going to know every little nuance. Um, we do, however, want you to know that there are resources out there. If you have additional questions, things come up. Right? Question comes up, where do we look? There's a whole wealth of resources um, on our website. We have all of our findings. We have this video presentation. Um, the summit booklet is on there, as well as copies of the laws. Guidance on how to comply um, with the executive orders pursuant to the COVID-19 crisis, um, but also our phone number and, and our email. Um, we want to make sure that um, if you have questions, you know the places you can look to find the answers. For those who haven't been to our website before, here's a, a, a clip of the, or a picture of the front page of the website. You'll see down in the bottom right-hand corner, we've marked it with, with two big arrows. You can't miss it. Um, it's our, our open government um, uh, link that you click on and you can access really all that information, that wealth of resources I was just talking about. It's all there on our website. So with that, um, that concludes the, the Open Meetings Act presentation. As you can see, for those who stuck around, Argo grew up and he's still really cute. Um, happy, happy to say. All right, folks, as Sean said, the Open Meetings Act presentation has now concluded. Um, if you have any questions that come up, please email us at our AG Summit email or tweet at us at AG Narona. For those of you who pre-registered with us, you've received an email from our office containing a link to this uh, continuing legal education form to sign up for credits there, as well as a link to the survey um, that we'd like you to fill out um, at the conclusion of our uh, training today. I want to make a note that the CLE form will only be available until 1.30 today. So make sure that you fill out that form to get your credits before it closes at 1.30. In the meantime, we are going to take a very quick 10 minute break before we dive into our question and answer session. So again, send your questions, fill out the CLE form, 
and start that survey, and we will see you back here in 10 minutes to answer your questions.
Welcome back. Uh, we're now going to have our question and answer session. Um, we've received a number of questions in advance. We've also received a number during the program today. Um, we're all going to be up here and take turns answering the questions. We have our, our masks on now that we're going to be in a bit closer proximity to each other, uh, taking turns answering some of these questions that have come in. We'll try to touch upon as many as we can. So the first few questions pertain to the more practical guidance and tips for conducting virtual meetings and the guide posted on the DBR website as well. The next question is, is related to that and asks what the likelihood is of continuing to allow virtual participation. And I think that's a question on a lot of people's minds. And we really don't have a set answer right now. Uh, of course, under the standard OMA, virtual participation is not permitted. Right now, virtual participation is permitted pursuant to the executive order. And those orders have to be periodically renewed. So it really is up to the discretion of the governor's office to continue to renew those virtual meeting executive orders. And also, the legislature, of course, has the option to amend the statute itself. So going forward, it'll be up to the legislature and the governor to make those decisions. Uh, I do suspect that we'll be dealing with virtual meetings for some period of time now, but we really can't predict exactly how that will play out in the future. It'll depend on the different decisions that are made. Sean, there's a question about if a municipality limits the number of video participants in a public hearing due to technology restrictions, is there an Open Meetings Act violation? And what if the number of video participants is limited, but the number of participants who call in is not limited? Yeah, you know, I, I think this is a great question, and it's something that I think sort of plays out um, a, a, as we sort of go along and, and get more used to using these remote means. Um, I can sort of analogize it, I think, to um, a complaint we've had in the past a number of times, which is, what if the room in which a public body is holding a meeting uh, reaches capacity? At what point would that become a violation? Um, and you know, I, I think our findings in the past have said, um, you know, that, that at least for the most part. If there's a reasonable accommodation for folks in the room, um, you know, the OMA doesn't really say anything about uh, the number of people that must be allowed to attend. Um, you know, it, it probably is not a violation. However, I think we could certainly envision a situation um, in which, for whatever reason, they elect to use a very small room um, for the express purpose of not allowing people to come. And I think in those kinds of circumstances, we might find a violation. So I, I think that that logic and reasoning applies to um, you know, remote meetings as well. Uh, you know, uh, to my understanding, most remote meetings, video conferencing, allow essentially an unlimited number of people to participate. Um, and so I think it's certainly our expectation, um, consistent with the requirement that you use adequate alternative means um, that that really as many people as want to join the meeting can't. 
Um, I, I think it's really very fact specific over whether you're using a particular software that limits the number of people who can come in. Would that be a violation? I, I, I see it as sort of, uh, sort of an outlier hypothetical. My understanding and expectation, I think, is that most of those softwares allow an unlimited number of people um, to attend and access that meeting. And that certainly should be the, the goal um, of any public body. Great. We also have a question related to the APRA and the executive order. And the question is whether agencies are required to still respond to APRA requests within the 10 business day period, and what if people are working remotely due to safety or illness considerations? Does the agency's response time increase to accommodate for this? So as Sean and Kayla discussed during the main presentation, the executive order that's in place now only provides an additional COVID-related extension to the Rhode Island Department of Health. All other public bodies are expected to comply with the normal deadlines set forth in the AFRA. Now, as we also discussed earlier, the AFRA does allow for a 20 business day extension if certain considerations are met. So if you're in a situation where you think you're gonna have difficulty meeting that 10 business day deadline, you have the option to look at that extension provision and to think about if your circumstances might fit into one of those permissible grounds for an extension and perhaps get a little bit more time that way. But there's no special additional extension for reasons related to COVID-19, <clears throat> unless it's DOH. We've also received a couple of questions regarding members of public bodies communicating with each other outside of a meeting. Uh, so, Sean, we have one question about a group that caucuses, a, a partisan party-affiliated group that caucuses to do things like discuss who will be the chair, the vice chair, lead advisory committees. And the question is if, if that caucus group includes a quorum of members of a public body, does that present an issue under the Open Meetings Act? Yeah, it, it, it's a great question because I think it comes up quite a bit. Um, it's something that I know our office has seen a, a number of times um, where members of the caucus are also members um, of the public body. And, and, you know, again, the Open Meetings Act applies when you have a quorum of a public body having a meeting. So if you have a quorum of your public body uh, together and they happen to be members of the caucus, the real question is, are you having a meeting? Um, and that means, are you discussing and or taking action over something uh, over which you have supervision, control, jurisdiction, advisory power. I certainly could see a situation where the caucus gets together. That's also a quorum of the public body. They get together, they talk solely caucus business. Who's going to be president of the caucus this year, vice president, and they leave it at that. I could also, however, see that being the intention and then sort of slipping into things that the public body itself has supervision, control, jurisdiction, or advisory power over. So I think public uh, members of public bodies also uh, are members of caucuses have to be very, very careful. I, I see it um, really akin to sort of a reply all, a Google Docs situation, where anytime you have a quorum of your public body, as soon as you start discussing things over which you have supervision, control, jurisdiction, advisory power, the OMA would apply. And if you're doing that outside of a properly noticed public meeting, that would be a violation. So I think you really need to be very careful um, and make sure that if you're going to have those meetings of a quorum of your public body, you, you're not having the, the meeting component um, by making sure you, you, you really limit your discussions to non-public body business. Kayla, we also had a similar question that asks about guidance for public body members who participate in social media conversations about proposals on which they may eventually cast votes. And if those conversations constitute information gathering that must be shared with their respective public boards prior to a vote, and if there are any other concerns about those type of online social media conversations. Sure, I think as we talked about during the Open Meetings Act presentation, that social media is becoming like more and more frequently used amongst public body members. And something to keep in mind is that when a public body or members of a public body 
are discussing matters over which their public body has supervision, control, jurisdiction, or advisory power over on the social media platform, the OMA could be implicated. A public, members of public bodies who are utilizing social media need to be aware of the risk of possibly forming a rolling quorum over social media related to those discussions and therefore violating the Open Meetings Act. And we've issued uh, several findings in the past sort of along the lines of electronic communications amongst public body members as well as social media conversations with public body members. And I would direct um, those viewing today to look at our most recent finding on this issue, which is Mosier v. South Kingstown School Committee. I believe that uh, finding site is OM20-19. It's where we sort of address the use of Facebook um, and a public body. Um, so again, public body members need to be careful when using social media so that they're not forming a quorum of their public body having a meeting over that social media platform. I think uh, public body members also need to be careful that they're not violating any other provision or bylaw or charter that pertains to their public body when utilizing social media and having those discussions. All right, turning back over to the AFRA, uh, we received a question about if a public body has an official policy that says, don't use your private email. Does that mean that if you receive an AFRA request, you don't need to search individuals' private emails, you would only search their public emails? Kaylin? Sure. So I think the easy answer to that question is it depends. Although your public body may have that specific policy that says, you know, members aren't supposed to be using their private email for official business, there's no guarantee that members of your pub public body really are not using their private email for public business. So I think you need to at least ask the question of the people whose emails are implicated, whether or not they truly are only using their private email for private business and their public email for public business. You need to do that inquiry to make sure that they are actually following that policy. Because if you fail to at least ask that question and confirm that they're not using their private email, um, that could potentially lead to a violation if that private email is actually still being used for public business and your public body failed to search that private email for documents that may be responsive to a request. We received a question about uh, how with many police departments considering implementation of body-worn cameras, I'd like to know more about how the AFRA applies to requests for images from law enforcement body-worn cameras. That's a great question. It's something that we've seen come up, and I'm sure something that will continue to be coming up. And the starting place is that these recordings, just like any other records maintained by the government, are subject to the AFRA. So the starting place is that these are public records unless an exemption applies. When dealing with law enforcement recordings, exemption D is the probably the most potentially relevant one. So if you receive a request for recordings from law enforcement body cams, you'd probably want to start by looking at exemption D and considering whether any of those exemptions apply, such as if the recording might reveal a confidential source or interfere with the right for a fair jury trial. And if you go through those exemptions and they don't apply, or you don't really have any substantive reason to withhold the recording, then the recording should be turned over. And I think this touches upon an area that the Attorney General mentioned from the very start of the presentation today, which is the importance of public trust in the government. And especially records like this. Disclosing records like this can really foster public trust and accountability with the government. So we encourage you to look at those records and to turn them over unless there's an exemption that applies and substantive reasons why disclosure would be problematic. And of course, this is also an area where redaction comes into play. If there's a reasonably segregable portion of the video that can be turned over, then that's what you should do. If you have the capability to redact or cut out parts of the video that may be exempt, 
but still provide the rest of the video, then that's the mindset that you should have in approaching this, to try to disclose as much as you can. We also received a request regarding um, when records become public. So the, the, uh, the question talked about if you have ongoing law enforcement investigations that are not concluded and, and work is still being done, the investigation is ongoing, at what point do the records become public records? Well, the answer to that is that as soon as the government maintains the records, they're subject to the APRA. And those records are public unless one of the exemptions in the APRA applies. So if you have ongoing investigations and law enforcement work, potentially exemption K related to draft documents might apply, exemption D related to certain ongoing law enforcement investigations, so there are potential bases for those documents to potentially be exempt. But if an exemption does not apply, then those records are public and are subject to the APRA. Sean, we received a question about whether a privilege or exemption log is necessary under the APRA, and if so, guidance on what to include in that document. Yes, the, uh, the privilege log question. Um, the wording of the Access to Public Records Act is that if you're going to deny access to records, you have to give specific reasons for the denial. Um, now, our office in a number of findings um, ha has laid out some of the parameters um, around what that means. Um, it is not sufficient to simply say these documents aren't public. Um, that's not giving specific reasons for the denial. However, we've never held, and, and no court has ever held, that specific reasons for the denial means you have to do a privilege log. Um, that being said, um, you know, I think there's always going to be a slight difference between the bare minimum of what the law requires and what the best practices are. And I know that where possible, when we can give what amounts to a privilege log, if we're withholding documents, um, we do so. I, I think it's, it's better for the public body to be clear about why you're withholding certain documents, if multiple exemptions apply to those documents. Um, and it's better for the, for the member of the public who's requesting those documents so they can better understand why they're being withheld. Um, so you know, I, I think it goes really to the Attorney General's point about there are going to be some forks in the road. And the more transparent, the more open you can be, um, in this case, that means closer to a privilege log, um, I think really the better result. We also received a question, Sean, about, you know, we had talked during the presentation about if a document is exempt under the APRA, for instance, a document that pertains to someone's own file, and we encourage the public body to think about, can you still turn this document over to them anyway, outside of the APRA process, uh, because it pertains to them? So we received a question about if doing that and releasing the document sets some kind of a precedent regarding that document. Yeah, I mean, in a word, no. Um, there's really no such thing as, as waiver or estoppel under the Access to Public Records Act, um, or indeed outside of the APRA, if you're giving a document outside of the Access to Public Records Act. There may very well be good reasons, someone's requesting their own criminal case file, that uh, you decide outside of the Access to Public Records Act to provide that document to that person. Um, there's no um, good reason that that particular requester shouldn't have it. Now, suppose two weeks later, um, someone else comes and requests the same record. Can you still withhold it? And I think that's essentially the question, and the answer is yes. Um, you're, you're certainly allowed to, um, to, to then you know, answer under the Access to Public Records Act, um, which in that particular scenario would be that it would be exempt. All right, well, we have time for, we're going to take uh, two more questions from ones that came in during the summit. Uh, Kayla, we received a question about under the APRA, is a public body permitted to waive fees or opt to not charge fees, or can only the court be the one to waive fees? Of course, so I think the, the provision that talks about uh, costs and prepayment costs under the APRA says that a public body may charge $15 per hour with the first hour free and 15 cents per page. It's that word may 
that gives the public body discretion whether they charge or, or not to charge. Um, the Superior Court certainly has the ability to waive fees if um, the requester seeks that sort of relief from the Superior Court, but of course the public body does have discretion when charging fees related to a public records request. We also see, received a question about uh, the example of the post-it note and you know that's all well and good that we're able to respond to requests that come on post-it notes but don't you have to be able to tell that it's an AFRA request? And that's true. There needs to be some indication to put the public body on notice that this is a public records request. And if someone submits something and does not comply with your AFRA procedures, and because of that you can't tell that it's a public records request, then that might create an issue where you don't even know that it's an AFRA request and then it's not really subject to the AFRA. But let me emphasize this. The importance of dialogue and communication is so important regarding the Access to Public Records Act. If you receive an email and you think it's a public records request or you think that that's what the person is trying to express, then I'd really encourage you to reach out to the person, to clarify, because you don't want to be in a position where you received something that the requester thinks is a request and you didn't interpret it as a request and then the requester files a complaint and our office is in the position of determining whether or not in those circumstances you should have been on fair notice that it was a request. So a lot of that can just be avoided by clarifying with the requester from the start if you think that something might be a public records request. And of course in turn members of the public who are submitting records requests should do everything they can to make sure that the request is clear, clearly identifies what it's seeking, and clearly identifies that it's being submitted as a public records request. Uh, I'm just going to really quickly hit on uh, two more points that came in through questions submitted during the summit. Uh, one was, if you're required in, uh, this is under the Open Meetings Act, in open call or in the minutes to state that you gave notice to a person being discussed in executive session, does that really waive the privacy because you're saying you gave that person notice? And uh, really what you can do in that circumstance is you don't necessarily have to name and identify the person. You can just note in the open call or in the minutes that the person being discussed was provided notice without giving their name so that you don't really um, lose the whole point of it being done in executive session to begin with. And then there's also just one more question about if, um, if public comment is going to be included as part of an agenda item, should you say that on the agenda? Yes, I'd encourage you to say that. As I think Sean was saying earlier, the more information you can give, the better. So if an item is going to include time for public comment, then put that on the agenda and let members of the public know that they can come and comment so that you're not in a position where someone from the public says, I wanted to comment, I didn't know I'd have the chance, I didn't have notice of that, and then there's a complaint. So by all means, give out as much information as you can. So that's all that we have time for today. We thank you so much for joining us for this virtual summit. Uh, we thank the interpreters who are here today, the closed captioning folks, Joe Auger from Roger Williams Technology Department, who's been a big help with this, Jay Rosenfield and Clerkbase, uh, and everyone who's made this summit possible. Um, thank you to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And please feel free to reach out to the Open Government Unit anytime if you have questions. And video of this summit will be available on our website for later viewing as well. Thank you.